Good morning, everyone who's joined us slightly early. Just as a little bonus, we've got a two and a half minute film that I made this morning uh, on my way into work, which we thought might be quite pertinent just in relation to our Congress. So I'll play that for you all now, uh, and then we'll move on to the first session. About halfway between Oxford and Reading, on my commute to work at the Museum of English Rural Life. There's a site in a place called Shillingford, where in 1956 the World Ploughing Championships were held. And this monument commemorates the event at which the Museum of English Rural Life was present, with a tent, a marquee full of objects. As you can see, this is a model given by Canada to commemorate that World Ploughing Contest. So much like our IEMA Congress of 1976, the fourth Congress, this was the fourth World Ploughing Contest. Of course, it wasn't completely representative of the globe at that time. It was, of course, a Global North Ploughing Contest. And we can see the countries that were present included Northern Ireland, Germany, France, Canada, of course, who gave the plan, Denmark, Sweden, Great Britain, Finland, the Netherlands, New Zealand, Belgium, the USA, and Norway. And had we been meeting in person for IEMA 2021, as was planned for 2020, on the coach trip across to Oxford to visit the University Museums in that city, we would have paused here and had a chance to take in this spot. Shillingford World Ploughing Championships, 1956. And back at the museum, we have a gallery devoted to the history of the museum and its collections and it's based loosely on the marquee that the museum had on this site in 1956 and includes a handful of the objects that were on display in that marquee at the time. A little taste of rural England, agricultural England for your morning. Welcome everyone. Um, I'm just looking at my clock and I, according to, to my clock, we have one minute to go before starting, but uh, I shall use the time to introduce myself again to people who perhaps didn't come yesterday. I'm Isabel Hughes and I'm Associate Director here at the Merle, but also Vice President along with uh, Ollie Douglas, who you uh, just saw um, having made a film this morning, who is our President of IEMA. I make it uh, time to start. So I'd like to welcome you to session four. And our chair for this session is my colleague who is Caroline Gould, Principal Archivist at the Merle. I've got one or two um, administrative details to mention. If you are a speaker participant, we suggest you keep your camera on and uh, unmute yourself as required. So muted, but we can at least see, see that you're with us. Other delegates, please keep your cameras and your microphones switched off. If you have a question, and we really hope that you will have questions, please type it into the chat and uh, we will uh, be gathering the questions up and the chair will uh, read the questions out on your behalf. Please remember also that the session is being recorded and uh, if you want to watch the videos, the presentations uh, on YouTube, you will find there's an automatic translate option. We have English subtitles, but if you want to translate the, the, the subtitles, you can do that by watching it in real time on YouTube. And the link to each of the films will appear in the chat. So at this point, I'd like to hand over to our session chair, Caroline Gould. Thanks, Isabel. Um, 
lovely to see you all, so many people here to talk about archive film, rural archive film, and it's nice to see my co-presenters on video. So thank you everyone um, for attending today. We've, we've got um, a session today, which is, consists of um, four presentations. One from Peter Moser. Thank you, Peter. Um, we received your presentation about half an hour ago, so thank you very much for that. Um, due to the wonders of the junk folder, um, Peter had sent it well in advance, but um, it, yeah, it was overlooked. So sorry about that, Peter, for the, um, the worry of that. Um, so Peter is going to start with introducing us to the European Rural History Film Association, which is how um, the, the, part, the speakers have um, met through that network. Um, and then we have th uh, three more presentations. So there's a presentation from me um, about the importance of a digital preservation strategy and from Sven Lefebvre at, from the Centre of Agrarian History um, about copyright issues and um, how to deal with those. And then Sid Weismer from the Frisian Film Archives and Henk um, Diestra have got a wonderful video from the Frisian Film Archives. Um, so if that's okay with you, and then at the end of that, we'll have a round table discussion where you can ask um, questions of all the panelists. Thank you very much. If we could start with Peter's um, presentation, thanks. film production outside the United States started after World War I. The films produced in the agricultural sector were used for educational purposes, for advertising products, for teaching new techniques and for the self-promotion of groups and institutions. While in France it was the government that funded a rural cinema campaign in countries like Switzerland, the agriculture sector itself took the lead. Farm women, for example, produced films to illustrate their work on farms and in the household already in the 1920s. A crucial period in the development of the rural film production were the 1960s, when significant changes took place both in the structures and in the actors involved. Up to the 1950s, agricultural films were almost exclusively commissioned films. They were contracted by state departments, agricultural organizations, and scientific institutions. The producers were small film production companies which produced feature films as well. Indeed, most of these companies could not have survived from the risky feature film business alone if they had not had a halfway steady income from their commercial activities. Quite often their commissioned films were shown as so-called supporting films immediately before a feature film was shown in the cinema. Crucial for the development of the agricultural film production was the rise and the breakthrough of television in the 1950s and the 1960s. Wir sind dann auch nachgegangen und sind dabei auf allerhand Grund gestoßen, aber auch auf merkwürdige Folgen, zum Beispiel die. TV provided a new outlet for the commissioned films. They were now shown in special programs for the farming population. Television became, in, in addition to the agricultural institutions and the state, an important financial support for rural filmmakers. Agricultural films were regarded as part of the economic, not the cultural world. That's why they were not judged as sophisticated and culturally valuable enough to be preserved for the future by the existing film archives. This attitude only began to change in the 1970s when the so-called auto director films began their remarkable career. <laughs> Intellectuals influenced by the student movement began to look at agricultural aspects, especially the peasantry in remote or mountainous areas from new perspectives. They literally produced new pictures, pictures their audience often did not associate with the rural world they had known so far. 
The author directors called themselves documentary filmmakers, convinced to show nothing but the reality. Even though agricultural films were not regarded as valuable enough to be collected, preserved and catalogued by the emerging film archives for a long time, the films are not lost. Many of them survived in the archives of agricultural institutions and have been rescued and catalogued by new archival institutions focusing on the rural world. Historians of the 20th century therefore gained access to an important source which was hardly used in the historiography so far. The main problems for historians were that films were difficult to consult for the researcher and almost impossible to check for the reader. And little was known about the context in which the films were created, about those who commissioned them, about those who produced them, or where they were shown, and what the audiences thought about them. Archival and research institutions from different European countries wanted to change that and created the European Rural History Film Association in 2017. The aim of the European Rural History Film Association is to make the films produced on rural Europe visible and equally important to provide rural historians with information on the context of these films. In order to achieve these goals, the European Rural History Film Association maintains a database and an online portal. The management of the database and the online portal is provided by the Archives of Rural History in Bern. Members of the association are archival and scientific institutions. The database is a working tool of the members of the association. It provides an overview over films produced on rural Europe in the 20th century. The entries in the database are continually upgraded and extended by the Archives of Rural History in Bern based on information provided by the member institutions all over Europe. The database acts as a guide to the films produced in European countries since the end of the 19th century. It provides, among other data, information on who was producing the film, the content and how the films were financed. Entries are structured along the identified films. Each entry provides context information on the work and guides researchers to institutions that hold archival sources or to other databases in which more information about the registered film is available. The database also entails information on whether the film has physically survived, where it is actually held, and whether there is a digitized version of it available or not. The database does not register copies or versions of a work. This is the task of specialized film archives where the physical copies are actually preserved. Access to the database can be gained by contacting the management of the database, the Archives of Rural History in Bern. The European Rural History Film Association online portal contains a selection of the films which are catalogued in the database. Institutions that hold digitized film material can make it accessible to the public via the online portal by joining the European Rural History Film Association. The films in the online portal are grouped by the institutions which make them accessible, and the thematic collections indicate the variety of topics which are covered in the online accessible films. The purpose of the European Rural History Film Association is to provide the necessary infrastructure for making films a source accessible for historians and the wider public alike. After a few years of existence, we can observe with contentment that researchers and readers are consulting the online portal. In other words, films are in the process of becoming an important source as well as an object of investigation in historiography. Hello, I'm Caroline Gould. I'm the Principal Archivist of the Museum of English Rural Life and the University of Reading's um, Special Collections. Um, today I'm going to talk to you a little bit about the types of film we hold at Merle, the relevant policies, how we preserve, preserve our film collections, how researchers access film and how we fund the film preservation strategy on our future plans. Um, so 
I'm afraid this has to be really quick, but we hold the Ministry of Agriculture's film library, um, which is very instructional films to farmers about new processes. And then we have promotional films from the Milk Marketing Board, National Dairy Council, and then um, agricultural manufacturers. And there's more information available on our website. We ha have two policies that really inform us on our film strategy. That's the collections care and conservation policy and the digital preservation policy. So if I just talk about those a little bit, obviously the collections care and conservation policy covers all aspects of um, collections care. So everything from environment and security um, to exhibitions. But the main section that we are focused on here is the digital preservation surrogacy and reformatting section. And it states in that policy that when items are in poor condition, we will uh, fund some format permitting endeavour to create a surrogate. We've surveyed all our vulnerable media, so the time-based media, so we know if there is a surrogate in place, um, if we have digital assets, and if we haven't, and then any resource implications of those and um, time scales for action on those. Um, the digital preservation policy also helps us. Um, obviously, that's looking at all aspects of digital um, assets and the workflows when they come in, accession, etc. Um, but it's the how we prioritise the work that I think helps us with this. Um, it, it states that if we, um, if a digital surrogate is required for preservation reasons, then we will um, create one. And also, if there's academic need, um, so they're the main drivers. So, how have we preserved our film collections in the past? Most of the films I've talked about are 16 millimeter reel to reel films. Um, and we have in the past 20 years ago, we were transferring things to VHS for viewing copy and Betacam SP. And then obviously then it transferred to a DVD and a DigiBeta. Our current policy is to um, create um, an MPG file for viewing and a YUV file and PAL compress file for preservation. Um, but we have all aspects of those. So we've still got just reel to reel that haven't got a surrogate and um, we've still got some on DVDs, etc. So we haven't been able to um, fund all that transfer to the new format. Um, how do researchers access film? Um, well, I can't really talk about this um, without copyright and it'd be interesting to see how many times this comes up in this section. Um, we've recently done some um, research on one of our um, film collections, the Ministry of Agriculture's film collection, and identified um, about 70 films that are now avail available on our virtual reading room um, because they've got no um, copyright implications. And then they're also available on the European, the European Rural History um, portal. Um, those that we have got copyright restrictions are available are going to be available on dedicated terminals in the reading room. Um, that's not quite in place yet, but it will be by the end of the year. Um, in the past, we would have just taken a DVD or a, um, a, the um, VHS into the reading room for people to see on a telly. Um, so how do we fund this preservation strategy? We have a small internal budget for preservation and conservation, and obviously sometimes we can use that for film but it's largely with external project funding. And we've been really lucky. We've um, worked with Ab Abigail Woods on the field project recently in the last 18 months. And that was what funded the research that I was talking about into the copyright um, and also some digitization to the, the current format of um, films for um, MAF. So what's our future plan? Um, well, at the moment, we have at the access copies, the MPG files, and with these are managed in our digital asset management system, our DAMS. Um, and our main focus, it really is on managing the preservation copies. Because they're so large, we haven't got enough room on a server to put them on, so they're all on hard drives, and then it's really difficult to manage them. Um, so that's a focus. We have um, just got funding for a digital preservation system, um, which, you know, which we are just at the early stages at. So this will allow us to um, not only manage those um, files, but also 
to check whether they're degrading in any way um, and so uh, really preserve them. So thank you very much. Um, I really look forward to any questions um, and there's more information on our website and we will um, please ask me any questions at the end of the session. Thanks very much. Hello everyone, my name is Sven Lefebvre and I work at the Centre for Agrarian History in Leuven, Belgium. Under the supervision of Professor Yves Segers and with my colleague Dianta Osseweyer, who is not here today, I work on a project called Cinema Rural. The project aims to map, to identify and to put to use the audiovisual heritage of agriculture and the rural countryside in Belgium. We have been working with agricultural films for over two and a half years now, and one of the main goals throughout the project is to share these rich testimonies of the agricultural past with the public. Yet, working with film and publishing film online also means dealing with copyright issues. This might seem like an excuse to not make films publicly available, however, Proper management of these copyrights make it possible to open up the richness of agricultural films for everyone. In this presentation, I will present to you five golden rules to keep in mind when putting films material to you. First tip, familiarize yourself with copyright legislation in your country. Copyright legislation differs from country to country. For instance, in Belgium, Copyright remains active until 70 years after the creator's death. In cases where the author has passed away, authorship can be passed on to relatives or someone who is specialized in managing copyrights to make sure the rights are respected. During this presentation, I will focus on the European and the Belgian juridical context, but the principles are universal. To keep yourself informed, you can join online communities such as the Europeana Copyright Community, which keeps you up to date with tips and tricks on copyright management. When copyrights are no longer applicable, a work receives the status of public domain. This means that the usage is no longer restricted by the copyrights. Second tip, contact your local film archive. Many agricultural films were commissioned by government bodies and often the cinematographers who were in charge are lesser known directors or producers. Finding the right people to settle copyright issues is not always an easy task. Film archives can help you in this search as they have many contacts as well as having access to all kinds of well-documented information. Chances are high that they can help you to get in contact with the right person. Relevant right holders to consider are the director, the producer, the dialogue writer and the musician who contributed to the work. Third tip, document your search. Once you have been able to trace back the legitimate right holders, you can contact them with your request to have their permission to use film material for the proposed purpose. Sometimes the right holders are family members who are more than happy that the material made by their loved ones is made public. However, in other cases, you may have to deal with certain fees to gain permission to use the images. Often, there are no fixed fees, so you can always take a shot and try to negotiate to get a more profitable price. However, it is not always clear who actually owns the copyright. Sometimes, you might know who you need to contact, but you are unable to reach the right person or organization, or maybe they do not respond to your emails or your calls. That is why you might want to keep note of the different steps you have taken in your efforts to reach out to the right person. If the copyright situation remains unclear, European legislation foresees the status of an orphan work, which can be registered in a European database after a diligent search. After this procedure is completed, cultural heritage institutions are able to make works in their own collections publicly available. If a rights holder eventually does show up, 
one can argue that the diligent search has been made and so highlight their good intentions, after which an eventual settlement can be arranged. The details and procedures for registering a work as an orphan work can be found by going to the links in the description of this video. Fourth tip, indicate the right status. When publishing film online or integrating it into a museum, indicate the right status. This can be done easily by using rightstatements.org. These statements are a set of standardized right statements that can be used to communicate the copyright and reuse status of digital objects to the public. These statements are supported by platforms such as the Digital Public Library of America and Europeana. Please note that when publishing content that you did not create yourself, you should use these statements. The more familiar Creative Commons should only be used to indicate the reusability when publishing content that you yourself created. And the last but certainly not least, share and promote the use of agricultural films. History is an important part of contemporary society. So putting in the effort to open up these artifacts of the agricultural and rural past is totally worth it. Just make sure to add the right references to the source and you are ready to work with agricultural films. Curious about future initiatives from Cinema Rural or other CRG projects? Make sure to subscribe to the international newsletters from CRG to receive a regular news update in your mailbox. A few years ago, the Frisian Agrarian Museum moved to a monumental farm close to Leeuwarden, the capital of the province of Friesland one of the northern provinces in the Netherlands. Friesland has a rich history of farming, cattle breeding and dairy. The Frisian Agrarian Museum tells many stories of Friesland's rural history. It has a permanent exhibition of machines, agricultural tools, paintings and photographs, which show how Friesland was and is intertwined with farming. The Agrarian Museum and the Frisian Film and Audio Archive have been collecting and digitizing agrarian films for years. In the new museum, historical film footage shows how the exhibited machines and tools were used. Henk Dijkstra, director of the museum, shows us around and will introduce us to the attraction of historical film for exhibition ends. Goedag, kom erin. Three years ago, we moved into this farmhouse to start a new museum. And we also had to give thought about how to make the new exhibitions. Well, of course, we have a lot of tools and objects, but also a lot of paintings, but that was not enough. We also wanted to use footage and film material. So in cooperation with the Frisian Film and Audio Archive, we managed to disseminate a lot of small fragments from their enormous collection, which could be used in our museum. In the 1900s, laborers from Germany came to Friesland to do harvesting work with farmers, in this case, mowing and haying. And the tools they were using with it, they took them with them. And here again, you see beautiful footage of how these tools were used in the harvesting time. So here we have a threshing roll. In this case, it's used for uh, threshing uh, rapeseed. And of course, to explain how it works and how it's used, you need a lot of text, but it's much easier to use footage. And here you see a beautiful example how that works. On the film, you can see how this tool is used. Sometimes they use it uh, on the land, like uh, here. You see here that it's being transported by a carriage, but it was also used in the farmhouse itself. Friesland was and is a dairy province. Milk is turned into butter and cheese. And in the old days, that happened on the farm. We have a lot of footage of how milk was turned into butter. And here you see a beautiful example how that worked. Uh, the tools and the utensils are placed next to the movie and you can see how the farmer's wife made butter.
thank you everybody um they were um very fascinating different aspects of film archiving i just want to check before we start just to see how many of the panel members have managed to join us today um i don't think hanks or um sids has managed to join us but if they have if they can make themselves known that'd be fantastic otherwise we'll direct the questions to um peter sven and i as the panelists um what, what i'd like to do first is offer peter if his internet allows to say perhaps just a few more words about the um your European Rural History um, Film Database. And then I've got a few questions that I'm going to ask the panelists. And if anyone else has questions for the panel, if you could put that in the chat now while we're just having um, perhaps the next five or 10 minutes um, chatting, and then there'll be plenty of time for other people's questions. Is that okay, Peter? Uh, yes. Um, well, I can just repeat uh, what I have tried to uh, present already in my presentation. The, the purpose of the uh, European Association uh, is, I think, a three or fourfold one. First of all, is to make um, to collect all the data which is available, which is uh, scattered, scattered around. Uh, all over the places, uh, making available the, the information about the films which were produced and there were thousands of films produced uh, on agriculture and the rural uh, countryside uh, from the, say, after the First World War. Uh, there, there were a few before, but uh, it really only starts in the 1920s. Uh, so that's what um, what's the purpose of the database to collect all the metadata about the films. Uh, and you can check yourself what kind of information is standardized in the database uh, for each individual film, not for, for, for the work and not for the, for the version of, of the film. And um, the, the second um, purpose was to make available a certain amount of these films uh, to the public and to researchers, because it is very difficult as uh, researchers, as historians, to use films because usually you, you don't have access to these films. And it's very difficult to get access to, to have access to these films. And uh, we have for a couple of hundred films now uh, solved this already. And uh, I think this is the, 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 the most um, important uh, development which has happened over the last uh, two or so years that uh, researchers actually are starting using these uh, this database and the online portal, and they are quoting these films. They're looking at these films just like they're looking at oral doc, uh, at oral history and uh, on written documents for the 20th century. And I think when I look at it, there are a, a few scientific articles appearing in in in, um, in in these days, and they are actually using these films. And not only that, they are using it. I think for me as a reader, then as well is extremely important so I can check what they were looking at. And I can do that as, as we all do uh, when we are looking at the, um, at the uh, what sources the, the, the researchers were using. So I think this is, this is, a, this is a crucial element. And um, well, but there's some future plans which we will discuss uh, uh, in the European uh, Association uh, um, over the next couple of months, uh, we also try to use films as a form of communication of historical insights. Uh, we have this uh, phenomenon now, uh, which has been uh, supported over the last year and a half, that um, written texts are a little bit marginalized and uh, videos, video essays become more and more important, especially for young, younger people. So we, we don't want to, we don't see uh, or we don't want to, to uh, replace written texts, but uh, to amend them. So that's what we will be talking about and what we maybe uh, we have some plans for the future in that direction. But the most important thing is to document the information we have on the film, do document certain amount of the films. Of course, not all the films can be shown online because many of the films which were made are not uh, were not preserved, and some films which were planned were never produced, but the information about these categ film, uh, categories of films are important as well. 
So um, that's basically what the uh, association is about. And uh, we are also looking for further in institutions to join the association and make their films available. We know uh, there are a lot, of, a lot of institutions all over Europe. We have so far about 15, but uh, there are a lot more which uh, have material in which they, they, they could make available via the uh, online portal or um, provide the necessary information for uh, incorporating it into the database. Thanks, Peter. And I wonder whether you could say something about how it's been funded so far, just so that the other participants understand. Yeah, this, is, this is probably the most crucial, uh, <laughs> the most crucial question at all. It hasn't been funded so far. That's the problem. It has been funded by uh, the membership. You know, the, the, if you are a member, the, if your institution is a member, then you pay 100 euro per year to the association. And uh, that money uh, is uh, it's about 3000 uh, euros, which we have collected so far, went into that project. But the project was mainly uh, financed by the Archives of Rural History. And this is a big problem because we are not funded by the public in, in Switzerland. We are a private institution and we also we, we, we have to, to find uh, funding for for, um, uh, for for projects like that. So that's a big problem and uh, but I think since we have some results now we can also look for more or for some money to uh, upkeep the, the, the ongoing process. It'd be really helpful to understand if there was another you know outside of Europe if there is another database like this um, and who knows the future could be a world database of <laughs> rural history um, but so if anyone knows of anything that'd be really helpful to find out um, I do have a question for Sven if that's okay um, I've been doing a similar project as Sven so I'm, I'm quite interested to hear what he has to say um, it's about the time time it takes to do the research for film um, and I it, it'd be helpful to know if you've um, if you've um, quantified that because um, often someone says to me oh can you clear this film and um, you know it's for me it's not a simple a simple process so I wonder if you can expand on that yeah, I think this is a very difficult question because not every film takes as much time as the other film. Um, I have had films where the I just had to send one email to one person and they responded 15 minutes later to say that they are all okay with everything we want to do and they are happy to cooperate. Uh, as I've said in my presentation, often these are this is the case when you contact someone who is the a relative of um, a smaller cineast who is not really well known, but they are very happy to see that the material of their loved ones is made public. So uh, you have very easy cases like that, um, which take like writing one email or making one phone, one phone call. Um, but there are other cases, cases in which we had to deal with, uh, we had to work with the film archives to really look into which people are still known uh, that might have uh, some rights from people who have died already or some people are professional right holders um, to, to make sure everything is respected and these people are often much more difficult to deal with uh, they have certain um, certain restrictions you you should keep in mind um, so I, I think it's hard to say it, it's that it's quantif quantifiable um, also, one of the main author rights we had to clear were the author rights for films made by the Ministry of Agriculture. Um, since Belgium is a very um, challenging country when it comes to uh, structures from the government, uh, we had really to look into it with the, the current uh, Ministry of uh, Agriculture, which is now uh, on the, Flem the Flemish level, so uh, not uh, a federal um, a federal subject anymore and they didn't know either who was the the copyright of the, the copyright holder of these films so eventually checking a lot of uh, documents checking different uh, laws which were passed in the parliament uh, we eventually found that the, the federal ministry of economy 
uh, was the current rights holder, and then we had uh, to negotiate uh, a new um, a new contract for this to use, and, and eventually we came out and we were able to clear all the copyrights in function of our project um, for 200 films at once. So that was a really major uh, achievement, but uh, it took a lot of time, a lot of patience also, because these uh, public services aren't always the fastest. Um, so it was really challenging, but uh, I agree that it is a very time consuming um, job. However, I think when you do this, um, once you have done it, this opens many possibilities for reusability and to open up this material to the public. And I think that is the main goal that we should uh, pursue. And, and, and I think it's really worth to put in the effort and to have everything clear at a certain point to go on with the future and future projects with these films. I agree totally, Sven. We had um, a post holder who worked two days a week for three months trying to clear the, our Ministry of Agriculture's film um, library. Um, and it, it's very time consuming. And actually, a lot of those films um, hadn't been produced by the Ministry of Agriculture. They helped, they kept them in their library. So it was not just one copyright holder, but it, you know, it was lots of different research projects. Um, to try and clear as many as we can, and and some of those we still we still don't know. Um, so it has been, but it has been a really worthwhile um, uh, project. And now we've got seventy that we can use, so that's great. Um, and that and everyone can see them. There's no copyright implications. Peter, have you got anything you would like to add on copyright? Um, no, I, I can just uh, support what has been said before. And uh, I think there are different institutions that will have different policies uh, to a certain grade. And we have always been, uh, quote, very liberally that we have used these films and we have used them uh, in the sense that we say they are, they are sources for scientific research. And if you quote them properly, then, uh, you know, then there should be not not a big problem. But then I know uh, there, are, there there's another side to it, and uh, so it's very helpful the work you have done and 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 uh, Sven and and um, his colleagues in, in in Leuven have done. We haven't put that much uh, uh, amount of work on that side. We have we are we are liberally using these films. We have we have about four four to five hundred in Switzerland, which we have been using. And we have never had any problems, you know, that uh, someone came along and said, uh, no, you can't use them. But then, of course, we don't use films uh, where we know uh, the, 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 the copyright holders would still be around or would be, uh, would be, um, wouldn't like to, to make their, their, uh, their films uh, public for the time being. But for the, for the older films, say up to the 50s and 60s, we, we don't, we, we haven't uh, came along very big problems so far, but that, you know, if, if, if someone comes along and say, uh, we don't agree with the films you have put, uh, we, we, you're showing on, on, on your uh, online portal, then we can take it from the online portal within a few minutes. So that's not, that, that isn't a big problem, but it's very important the work you and, and Sven are doing uh, to, to clear that problem. I'm, I'm looking more from a historian's point of view, using them as a, as a, as a source, I use other sources for scientific purposes. I make it clear. And I think the, the online portal of the European Soci Society helps actually to make clear where the film comes from, who was producing it, who was holding it. All that information uh, can be made available in the article or in the book you're writing using the film form. So I think uh, it is, it's, 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 it's a big field we, we're working on, and, but I think we, we are in, we're going in the right direction. And there, I think we have different, different uh, pathways to the goal. I agree, because I think the portal actually is a lot clearer for describing films than my cataloging database that we use here, because that's a general cataloging database. And so it hasn't got all the different films, fields, sorry, that you require to catalog film. Um, it's, you know, often we have to group that together in one field. So I think it is, great that we've been able to participate in the portal. Now I know that there is, um, uh, um, Ollie has asked a question in the um, chat. Ollie, I wonder whether you wouldn't mind um, coming on video to ask your question. 
It might make more sense if you ask that one. Thank you, Ollie. Hello. Thank you for uh, brilliant presentations, everyone. I'm just going to find my question because I've written it at, at length in the chat. Sorry, it's a bit <laughs> long. Um, the, the panelists were talking about very different kinds of films, so some very personal and some familial, some national in scope, and others shared much more widely. Um, and I know that this was something that came through in Peter's original vision for the, the association was that it would link up some of those international copies of films. Um, but picking up on some themes that came up yesterday of those different scales of interaction and practice. Um, I'm wondering whether the panelists could all reflect on the challenges, the opportunities, and perhaps also some of the, the practical issues, copyright issues potentially arising from or afforded by these different kinds of sources, because they seem to be quite different. Peter, do you want to start on that one? Uh, not really, since I wasn't <laughs> able to follow the, the, the presentations yesterday. I'm, I'm high up in the mountains and uh, <laughs> I wasn't able to follow, uh, so, so I can't really answer the, uh, because I don't know exactly what well, I can, is. Uh, Peter, if it's helpful, I just, uh, we were talking a bit about those different scales of operation. Um, so, so in a, uh, I don't know, in a similar way to Bradell looking at big long-term large-scale international structures and uh, regional structures and then and then those sort of smaller local personal interactions those micro histories mm -hmm. some of that came up in some of the museological work that people are doing and it strikes me that that similar kinds of scales of use of these films the kind of purpose of them is coming up in the work that you're uh, addressing and, and drawing together and i just wonder whether there's there's anything you have to comment about those different mm -hmm. scales yeah, maybe we could um, we well we could say that those institutions which make their their films accessible via the European portal, uh, they are still responsible for what they are doing. It's not the European Association as such which is responsible for it because we can't do that. We only provide a platform. Uh, so, um, in in the end, it's always the institution which uh, makes their films. Um, uh, accessible via the portal, they are in, uh, they, they are responsible for what they are doing. Uh, so, in that sense, you have different surroundings, different regulations, as Ben has uh, pointed out. And um, and and, and um, say, for example, take the, the example of France. France, they, they have many films uh, which uh, are accessible via the ministry. But the ministry, they don't want to make their films accessible via the online portal so far. But we haven't really reached <laughs> the, the, the relevant per, uh, people in the department because, as you uh, probably all know, uh, the French bureaucracy is a, has a certain, uh, uh, well, we all know. So that takes time. But in the end, uh, it, it shouldn't be a problem. And we have many institutions, especially now in Switzerland, of course, because we know the people and the people know us a little bit better uh, than on the European level, maybe. A lot of institutions have actually contacted us and said, can't we make some of the films accessible via the European portal? It's mostly us who contact the institutions. But um, so uh, to come back to the question, of uh, to what Ali said, uh, I think there are different regulations, different practices, and uh, but we have one portal uh, where we can show at least a certain amount of these films. And then, of course, if you if you are looking at a film, say for example from the Austrian Film uh, Museum, and then uh, if you are interested in that film. Uh, you go to the Austrian Film Museum, but then you know what the film is if you have seen it on the European portal. Then you go to the Austrian Film uh, Museum, and uh, you you can negotiate. and And, and um, I think that this can be done with all the institutions who present their film material via the European. So we have a lot. There's of quite a range, Peter, isn't there? There's quite a range of films. So um, amateur films, as well as we we've spoke quite a bit about Ministry of Agriculture films in Belgium and and in England. But there are amateur films that um, a lot of the partners hold. Um, so it's it's not all. Um, there's a whole range of films um, that are brought together on that portal. Yeah, and and um, uh, amateur films is it's. 
we all think it's clear what an amateur film is, but if if um, if if the, the the Farm Women's Association of the 1920s in Switzerland has produced a film, then it was an amateur film as well, even though it was an association. But that association, as such, doesn't exist anymore. Mm -hmm. And uh, that, then it it is in some ways an amateur film as well, even though it was made by a professional. <laughs> so so uh, these categories are fluid, you know, and. Mm -hmm. um, I think we, but, but we have the example of the, our colleagues in St. Költen, they have a lot of, uh, they have thousands, uh, I think about 60 or 70 thousands of amateur films, and they don't make them publicly because these films are uh, mainly from the 60s and 70s. Uh, mm -hmm. So it's an all, uh, it's a completely different kind of film material which we have there. But mm -hmm. um, as soon as they have cleared the, the, the copyrights, they can could be made of, uh, accessible via the uh, European online portal as well. Sven, do you want to add anything? Because we've got another question. Do you want to add anything uh, to that? Yeah, I just wanted to say that I also think that the international cooperation we've had between the different members of the association has really uh, helped me um, in the project I am doing. Uh, I recently contacted you for the usage of some footage uh, from one of the Ministry of Agriculture films I found on the online portal. But also, um, we saw that the, the collection from the Ministry of Agriculture in Belgium was a very international collection, which held, held, held um, films from France, from the Netherlands, Great Britain. And it was very interesting to see the similarities and, and the, the usage and the circulation of this knowledge. In fact, the knowledge of circulation of knowledge in, within Europe, in fact, uh, in this agricultural society. And on the other hand, I think um, what I experienced is, experienced is that I have been searching for films on a very local level. So really uh, certain cities or uh, communities, uh, we have a certain uh, video clubs, they are called. So just people who, as their hobby, have been filming their whole life. They have films from dating from the 50s until now of a certain agricultural region. And they have very interesting films with certain footage I have never seen. And thanks to the European portal, we are able to put this very local, very regional uh, level onto a European platform, uh, which gives much more exposure. And, and, and I think this is very rich to, to, to have that opportunity to um, put these kind of films on a European scale in the picture. Um, and maybe also to answer uh, the question relating to the, the, the diversity of material. I think this is also a great opportunity because I recently came across uh, more and more uh, home movies and amateur films, uh, whereas I had been, more, in, been no, more interacting with Ministry of Agriculture films and these films are completely different and they give you a completely different uh, perspective on rural life and certain practices which were uh, used because these films from the ministry were really direct. I, every film is directed, but they have a clear direction uh, they are heading to, they are instructional, while sometimes home movies are much more like a natural flow within the film. And mm -hmm. this often gives total, uh, a total different footage, which is very nice when you are working with this footage for, for instance, video productions or you want to document a certain practice uh, in agricultural history or the usage of a certain tool in agriculture, then you have these two kinds of, of all kinds of different footage you can use to, to really have different perspectives on one subject. And I think this is also the opportunity of the diversity of the material we are dealing with. Thanks, Sven. Um, we do have another question, which is, um, is um, about display, film display, um, inspired because of the wonderful um, presentation by Henk um, at the Frisian Agricultural Museum. Because um, we have um, done a redisplay recently. We have got archive film in there, but I feel they, they have displayed the film against the um, objects so wonderfully there. It's a, a brilliant example. And I just wondered whether, you know, Sven or um, Peter wanted to comment on that. I certainly would like to do that if we were going to do something in the future. I think it would be a really nice way to use the film we have. We weren't quite ready when we did our redisplay because of the copyright research. We hadn't 
done enough of that. Um, so yeah, we were, yeah, we've done it a bit too late, but uh, mm. is there anything, do you know of any other examples where they've um, used film in displays like that? Um, yeah, this is something we have dealt with also during our project. We are now in the last months of uh, the Cinema Rural project. And oh. we also, with, um, with the, the COVID pandemic, we have been limited in all kinds of things we plan to do. But um, we are now working uh, on different um, outcomes where we are working with these films. And the original idea was always to just have some screenings of these films. However, many of these films um, are, there's a lot of them which are quite the same. So when you have seen five minutes of them, you get the message. So it's, there, there's not always a point of showing this film 30 minutes long um, without uh, context. You, also, you always need context around the film to make it more interesting for a non-expert non audience. Um, you can tell about things we, we see in, in the film. I have made a compilation for, um, contemporary agronomists, for instance, there was a, a conference and I made a 15 minute compilation of different uh, footage and they just perceived this as very funny to look at. So I, I, it was perceived as a bit funny to see how farming was done in the past. Um, so you, you can play with that, um, that old thing of the, the present versus uh, history. So these are things I feel that work more than just displaying the film alone. I think you have to do something with them and this can be very creative. Uh, one of the last things we are doing right now is actually working with an app in which you can um, go for a walk in a certain region. We are uh, working with a museum um, about uh, fruit and um, they have a, a walk of five kilometers around their museum. And we are now connecting certain fragments of film with certain um, locations at that walk, for instance, uh, at where the, the apple uh, fruit guards were are um, situated to show how uh, the, the, the sector of the agricultural sector worked in the 1950s, 1960s, and how uh, this has influenced the landscape, for instance, uh, until now. And so we use that film to show that to the public and to have more interaction with their environment. So it is one of the things we are doing right now. Thanks, um, Is there anything you want to add, Peter, or shall I move on to, yep? Yeah, yeah it's just one example. Uh, the, the, the agriculture museum, one of the agriculture museums in Switzerland, they are actually, we are pro, uh, uh, providing for them for the, some of the tools they are showing. Uh, and uh, they, so far they only had the uh, text explaining what these tools or machines were used for. And they are now providing video clips on certain footage from certain um, extracts from films, you know, how how a certain tools or so were used. So there's all kinds of, of um, rearrangements which can be done even if an, even if an, um, an exhibition already exists. Thank you. Um, Pierre, um, thank you for putting in the chat about the Ministry of Agriculture um, in uh, films in France. Is there anything else you want to add to that? You're welcome to come on video if you do. Isabel? Yep. Uh, it's okay, it's okay. Hello. I will Hi, wait. Pierre. You're wait. Okay. Links. No problem. Hello, everybody. So, yes, the French Ministry of Agriculture has refounded his uh, Mediatek, open since uh, more than 30 years. And I will put on the chat the right address. But of course, they need a convention with the people asking to express what are the use you will do with those photos or those uh, films. If you use them in a museum, you must tell why, when, mm. and so on. That's to avoid great. any copyright and uh, commercial problems. I will just right now, oh, you got it. Yes, you got the right, uh, yes, it's on the screen now, on the chat. You got the right address because Thank it changed you. some weeks ago. Okay. 
I love your backdrop as well. Thank you for bringing that into the session. <laughs> we, we've just got one, a few more minutes, so we need to be quite quick on this to keep to time. Um, but um, Isabel has asked about how films are most used apart from in museum displays. Is there anything you want to say, Sven or Peter? I think well, this, this is, um, yeah. no, go ahead, Peter. <laughs> My experience is that uh, historians are using them more and more. We, for example, in our institution, we are, we are conducting a research project on working animals, and we are uh, heavily using these films, not only the Swiss films, so we were very glad for the Frisian films, for example, or, or films from other countries. Now, they are very important for our scientific uh, research uh, on working animals. For example, so so that's one one section, and and then um, well, it's difficult to know who is looking at these films. But um, from what and and uh, that's really what my purpose is to make them accessible for researchers, for the scientific research, and for the museums, for the, for a wider public. Sven, do you want to comment? Yeah, I think the main other usage uh, would be scientific usage. However, we also had cooperations with uh, television program makers who were looking for certain footage to use in their, um, their certain episode they are working on, uh, also for local newspapers and so on to put on their website. So it's, it's really diverse in who is using these films uh, from, our, uh, from my experience, at least. Um, I don't think it's really easy to tell. There's a certain group, but people who are interested in history and, and then it goes very wide in, in use of these films. Thank you. And then there's one, um, one more question, um, which I will start to answer, but if we, we've only got a minute, so I might follow this up. It's, it's directed to me about preservation. So, um, it's we do keep the original reels after digitization um we are hoping that the digital files will um will not become obsolete and we are um we have a digital preservation system that we have just purchased um and we are going to be checking those um image files film files um and to make sure they're not degrading so um what we're hearing is they're going to be the future um, but we've been there before which hopefully my um, presentation showed we've we've had to migrate and migrate and migrate with film um, and you can migrate but obviously every time you migrate it, there's less quality um, but obviously there's a lot of cost involved in as well so it's um, for instance we have migrated from uh, Betacam SP to digital uh, rather than going back to the reel to reel, but we, you know, we preserve the reel to reel because that is the best quality. If we have to go back to it, um, I don't know whether we've probably got less than a minute. If anyone else wants to come in with that, they're welcome to. But if not, please um, contact me directly, and I can um, give you a, a, a full um, reply to that. Um, I, I'm conscious that. Sorry, I, I'm going to cut you off, actually, because I don't want those sessions to overrun. But I do want to thank all the panellists. Thank you very much and for the presentations. Um, it's lovely to see you after the pandemic um, as well. Um, and I do hope as a part, partners we'll be able to meet again. And I, if anyone has got any questions um, for our, any of us, I'm sure we'd be happy to follow up by email. Thank you. There is going to be a short break now of 15 minutes. I don't know whether I'm supposed to be saying this, but um, Ollie, Isabel can come in <laughs> and, and say that. Thank you. Thank you very much, Caroline. And, and thank you as well to, to the speakers for a really, really interesting session and some great films as well. Um, so thank you. Yes, we have 15 minutes now for you to have a break. Uh, but during this uh, 15 minute slot, you'll be able to see me um, reading out a presentation that was prepared by Chris Green, who is a past fellow of the Museum of English Rural Life. And he's been working on an historical dictionary of agricultural tools. The film is about 10 minutes long, so you'd have a bit of a chance for a break and, and the film, but it's entirely up to you. 
obviously when you're away the best thing is not to turn off zoom but you could turn off your camera and uh, mute yourself while you're away but thank you very much we're back in 15 minutes is clipped in all right this time, so let's see how straight a furrow she can make. No, that won't do. Driving straight isn't as easy as it looks. You've got to keep your eyes on the marking stick all the way down the field. The smallest bend will put the whole job out. Today, farming is as technical as any other commercial enterprise. Modern methods of production have considerably reduced manual effort on the farm, but in many cases we're still having to use old buildings which were put up to serve totally different purposes. In one village, a saddler is still at work. He's had to adapt his work to changes too, and as well as doing harness making and repairs, he's also the village cobbler. There is one wheelwright in the area, Formerly, his main work was making farm carts and wagons. Now these are factory made and he's left little but repair work. Jack Brown is having a field sprayed tomorrow morning, but his precautions begin today with a warning to a beekeeping neighbor. Bob lost several colonies last year because Jack never thought to tell him about spraying the field over the hedge. If the butcher can only offer a heavy, fat, bony joint, one that's going to come to more than she wants to pay, she just won't have it. She knows what she wants. Certainly not a joint that's going to leave her with a tin full of dripping. Who wants to pay three and sixpence a pound for fat when they can buy it already refined at one and four? No, the housewife... As farming becomes increasingly complex, computers are undoubtedly going to be used more and more. And British firms, with their experience and expertise, are confident that they will have a major role to play in the farming of the future. Thank you very much. Welcome back. And um, apologies for not having uh, presented the right film. Uh, that was not Chris Green, as you will have spotted. That was uh, some films from our math collections put together uh, by Caroline, my colleague, Adam Lines, uh, just to give you a flavour of some of the films we talked about earlier. So this next session is session five, and um, it's chaired by Ollie Douglas, uh, president of the IEMA and curator of Merle Collections. And once again, I'd like to say if the presenters could keep their cameras on and their microphones off and everyone else keep both your microphones off and your cameras off, please do ask questions in the chat and we will relay them so they'll be asked of the speakers. Um, so now, I'll, and also do remember that if you want to uh, translate the uh, presentation subtitles at all on any presentations, you'll find that by going onto the YouTube links where there are films. I'd like to pass over to Ollie Douglas now. Thank you. Thank you, Isabel. Um, and welcome back for session five. We're running very slightly behind, so I'll be I'll be quick and try and catch us up. It's a, it's a great pleasure to welcome you to a, a roundtable session of sorts, but our roundtable sessions, as you'll have gathered, look much like our other sessions because of the technology we're working with, which uh, in, in our skill levels is not akin to the, is quite akin to the um, agricultural computer skills of those in one of the films that Caroline and Adam had shared with us in the break. Um, so the session is called Working with Agricultural Tools, and we're taking a broad approach to material culture, and we're really pleased to have three amazing speakers here for you. Um, Kerry Lee 
Birchill comes second in the lineup and will claim that she's sandwiched between two uh, very great heavyweights of the field, but she is also uh, an incredibly talented uh, and, and well-respected colleague and got a mention yesterday for having shared uh, inspiring work that had inspired uh, Elsa Hirtala uh, of the Sarka Museum. So uh, she's she's not uh, she's not she's in great company, um, but she's part of that great company. Um, first up, we have Hugh Cheap, who um, I think I'm right in thinking uh, was actually present at the fourth agricultural congress here in Reading in 1976. Uh, shortly after that hot summer. Um, I won't ask him to comment on that, but he's going to share with us some of the amazing approaches to material culture research and uh, education that they use at the National Centre for Gaelic Language and Culture at the University of the Highlands and Islands. Um, Hugh is uh, known to many of you, I'm sure, uh, and was based for many years at the National Museums of Scotland, um, where he worked very early on with the, the late, great Sandy Fenton. Um, so it's great to welcome Hugh to join us today. Kerry Lee Birchill, who I've already mentioned, is a, a wonderful, talented and amazing colleague of mine from the Executive Committee of the International Association of Agricultural Museums. She's currently serving as our Secretary General and has kept us uh, afloat and technologically savvy uh, uh, through the, the pandemic period and beforehand. Um, so we were already up to speed with online video conferencing. Um, she's going to share with us some amazing uh, uh, amazing insight into the ways in which they work with objects and some pretty surprising stuff uh, at the, the the Ingenium Group at the, Ca the Canadian uh, Agriculture and Food Museum, um, where she is Director General. And uh, finally, we have Bob Powell. Bob, again, will be known to many of you. Um, he's been in and around draft animal activity and uh, museums of agriculture for many years now. Um, and I think I first met Bob at a, another executive committee meeting of the International Association of Agriculture Museums at Kittick side. Uh, some years ago and I couldn't remember and he couldn't either how long ago that was um, but it's brilliant to have Bob with us uh, and he'll have a, a wonderfully self-deprecating uh, title to his presentation um, but he has amazing stuff to share. So uh, without further ado over to our presentations. Good afternoon. I'm most grateful to Aima for giving me the opportunity to say something about um, our MSc course in the University of the Highlands and Islands and in the Gaelic College, particularly because our course uses material culture, I hope, in ways that are innovative and new. So this is our title slide. And um, just for fun, so to speak, for the occasion that we're enjoying today, I've translated my front slide uh, into Scottish Gaelic to give you a sense of what it might look like and also to offer you um, a title for Aima um, in Scottish Gaelic. I hope this doesn't offend. Well, this is the front page of our presentation um, that we give to potential students and to first year students of the MSc course and shows the very attractive campus site um, in the south end of the island of Skye in Scotland's Hebrides and puts the title on the left hand side and translated into uh, MSc Material Culture and Gaeltor History and our two contacts for interested students. The selection of images that we have on our slide presentation, of which this is a shortened example, are all familiar, I'm sure, to members of AIMA, since they're drawing on regional culture, on regional ethnology, and on topics that are familiar, I know, to all of us. But more to the point for us, they tackle aspects of um, Highland and Island history or Scottish history that are not usually um, part of conventional university courses. And this is a very important principle that we are able to turn to material culture and of course to language to um, explore these areas of um, Scottish history and social and economic history uh, in ways that perhaps are 
surprising to our students. They, these are new concepts and new views of conventional history. It's particularly important for um, aspects of Scottish history because uh, Highland history particularly is very well provided with notions of stereotypes and perhaps these stereotypes, we have to try to cut through these stereotypes in a way that is different. So just as um, our opening slide, which in a way introduces us to classic regional ethnology, here we have a very admittedly poor map of, the, uh, of Scotland, but showing the broad divisions between different uh, aspects of soils and regional differentiation between arable uh, mixed agriculture and pastoral. So you will notice that towards the north and the west, towards the left hand and upper side of our map, we have a largely pastoral country. And this is a ruling principle, a ruling concept behind so much of Highland history. Well, this is born out on the ground where there are very interesting aspects of identity, identification, that link language to regional ethnology. So that the, um, this particular district of the West Highlands, um, it's known in English as Kintail, uh, Kintala in Gaelic, and proverbially referred to as Kintala Nambo, Kintail of the cattle, giving it that sense of identity. Well, um, this is a teasing comment on the left where uh, we have a rather confusing, perhaps, to modern audiences map of Central Highlands. And it says the road north, but where has the A9 gone? This is uh, the A9 is a major trunk road going through the middle of Scotland from uh, south to north. And if you look at this image from the Atlas Novum of 1654, because Scotland was very well mapped in the Atlas Novum, um, we don't really see the A9. And in fact, we get a sense of axes of communication that are different from uh, the conventional ones as we understand today. Well, going down to the level of agriculture, this slide uh, is titled Planting potatoes, planting the potato. And it makes the point that the man is using a different sort of spade from what you would expect. And it says uh, the straight spade is being put to use, would be put to use. So you, as we know in ethnology, you cannot call a spade a spade without differentiating it in many different ways. Now, in terms of evidence for this period of before the Highland clearances, this notorious era of Highland history, we uh, look for images that help our uh, linguistic evidence. And um, as an example of this sort of um, evidence, uh, visual evidence we have, because much of the Highlands and Islands is poorly documented in terms of uh, imagery, we have an interesting um, almost caricature, I suppose, from about 1800 uh, of um, uh, a lady going up the hill to collect peat in her basket and spinning as she goes. The, all the details of this well brought out in our museum collections. Well, to look at this principle concentration, principal focus of Highland culture through the ages, I show this slightly fanciful uh, print of a drove of cattle being taken to the market. And Torod ma fetaloch means basically the, the, the product of um, the wealth of the hills in terms of cattle. And though this is a fairly romantic early 19th century or mid 19th century painting of a cattle drove. It is, uh, it, 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 it carries many stories and it can be well described in so many ways. This is an example of evidence that I came across when I started at the Gallic College in 2007, where 
I was looking for material culture evidence in language and found this wonderful song to a Highland cow um, in which I just transcribed one verse from a 14 or 15 verse song to a Highland cow. And the words mean, she being broad in the brow, scant from her eyes to her muzzle, in other words, a short measurement from her eyes to her muzzle, coat long, black and dense, and no higher below the knee than the span of my hand. Now, what struck me about that, this song from about 1800, uh, it betters the breed improvement books of the late 19th century. This is a very good recommendation for the best sort of Highland cow uh, that was such a marketable uh, asset, as I was saying. Well, of course, such an important aspect of the Highland uh, economy was the shielding system and transhumans. And of course, the Traces of that are evident in the countryside, but um, we have drawings and um, informations, say, from the antiquarians from the, and the archaeologists in the middle of the 19th century, which shows us um, shillings um, being still used in the hill grazings uh, as part of the system of And just in a way to surprise our students, uh, the milking of sheep um, had more or less died out in the early 20th century, but uh, this picture from the distant island of St Kilda shows the milking of sheep. And in terms of handling the products uh, of milk, of the milking of the sheep, where, or where the, um, the uh, and the milk and the cattle, the, the milk would be made into cheese and carried back from the hilltop grazings to the townships in vessels, clay vessels such as this. And this, the title of this slide um, is The Taste of the Kraga. And it has a whole realm of proverbial meaning behind the use of pottery vessels. And so this, again, is an attempt to bring out the best that we can from material culture and unite it with language to give us some sense of richness and um, some sense of um, completeness of the social and economic picture, the ethnological picture of uh, agriculture. Well, fishing, uh, just one slide from the middle of the 19th, early 19th century. Again, perhaps caricaturing these Highlanders because they're shown in uh, Highland dress, whether they wore Highland dress or not, um, is a moot point. But when they were fishing in the river, I think this man would be spoiling his shoes. But what he, sh what we are shown is the use of the fish spear um, and the so-called burning of the waters, attracting the fish to the light where they're speared and uh, caught by the men in the wading up the river. Just to look at briefly at the Highland clearances where the sheep stock were huge was hugely expanded in the 19th century the earlier type of sheep which have largely been forgotten a type of medieval animal um, known very fondly in gallic tradition as the the white-headed sheep kure kjalnun and so the the name of these sheep survives in gallic tradition uh, and would be largely lost were it not for i dare say us Packing it up as part of our course. I've mentioned the Highland Clearances once or twice, which, re which relates to the complete agricultural revolution and overturning of the pre-existing economy. And the sheep enclosure, or fank, uh, this phrase at the top, ekenain, is at the fank. And you can see these people um, shearing sheep in the, uh, in the sheep fank, in the enclosure. And of course, it, to the uh, informed eye, this shows um, a completely different form of agriculture from um, milking the sheep uh, on the shore or something like that. This is a much more capitalistic enterprise. And just to round off this, the wealth of tradition that exists in Gaelic, we have the picture of 
the band of women, it is always women who are shrinking the cloth and beating it to um, beat out the the um, the the urine that was used to soak it to shrink it and the vein of singing is itself hugely important it survives because of the material culture uh, actions of um, shrinking the cloth and the singing survives to today to be a popular form of Gaelic song but it preserves large a view of Gallic society in the 16th century and before. So this is a, just a very quick impression of what our course consists of and how we might use material culture in an interdisciplinary way to uh, inform students and perhaps to break the mold of conventional university studies to some extent, and of course, to use agricultural museum collections. Now, there is an opportunity, there will be opportunities for uh, all my listeners to come to the Gaelic College to do a short course and to learn Gaelic. And this is our campus um, in uh, the south end of the Isle of Skye. And as you see, the sun uh, is always shining. Bonjour, mon nom est Carolee Birchall et je suis la directrice générale du Musée de l'Agriculture et de l'Alimentation. Hello, my name is Carolee Birchall. I'm the Director General of the Canada Agriculture and Food Museum in Ottawa, Canada. I use the pronouns she, her, and for those audiences with visual challenges, I am filming this portion of my presentation in the Food Preservation, the Science You Eat exhibition. Before I begin my presentation for the IEMA 2021 World Congress, I would like to first acknowledge that I live and work on the traditional and unceded territory of the Algonquin Anishinaabeg people. Staff and visitors to the museum appreciate being able to learn and work in this environment. I would like to thank the organizers and my co-presenters for the opportunity to share some insights into how our museum team has used agricultural tools in some innovative ways to engage our audiences. It is a daunting position to know that my presentation is sandwiched in between two world-renowned experts on this topic, Bob Powell and Hugh Cheap. My objective with this presentation is to take a completely different angle on working with agricultural tools, and as such, I will be referring to our visitor experience work and the sometimes Herculean task of capturing the curiosity of audiences of every age, background, interest, and attention span. My hope is that all of you might go back to your institutions or research and look at your agricultural tools with fresh eyes. To this end, I will be using a broad definition of tools to mean something used in the practice of a profession or in some cases, the means to an end. Yes, they are tangible objects or instruments that were invented and refined to serve a particular purpose, but perhaps they can have another legacy to serve as snapshots in time of the science, materials, market demands, environmental studies, and industrial practices of a particular time as we all interpret agricultural heritage for and with a public that is often far removed from the farm. The museum is located on a 400 hectare active science research station only minutes from Parliament Hill. With over 200,000 visitors to the site a year, the demographics range from very young school children to senior citizens and from domestic tourists to international trade delegations. As such, the museum curators and visitor experience staff are always on the lookout for new ways to pique the interest of a wide diversity of guests. As one of the National Museums of Science and Innovation, the Canada Agriculture and Food Museum explores the science, technology, engineering, arts, and math that support agriculture in its many facets. Visitors to the museum may be surprised to find tools or instruments like a DNA synthesizer or a spectrometer in an exhibition that's located directly above our active dairy operation. However, the museum team feels it's very important to show these tools as they help us talk about the many, many, many careers that support agriculture and the products that we all rely on for our quality of life. Scientists, researchers, nutritionists, producers, and entrepreneurs of every stroke are required to tell the story of agriculture in Canada. 
When asked to present on this topic, I searched my memory bank for some of the aha moments when it came to using agricultural tools to build new conversation starters with visitors. This has often meant that the tool is put in an unusual spotlight to provoke questions and to give a sneak peek at some of the agricultural work and processes that are invisible to most consumers. One example that makes me smile was in an exhibition titled Apple Cake. The exhibition gallery and the then new learning center needed a temporary installation while we worked on developing the food preservation exhibition. The museum team came up with the concept that would highlight tools and objects in the collection that had never been on view, while at the same time crossing over into the food literacy theme. The result was an exhibition that looked at parts of our collection in relation to a French Canadian heritage recipe for apple cake. The premise was that visitors received the recipe to make apple cake at the entrance to the exhibition and then learned what production, processes, tools, and labor were required for each ingredient. By far, my favorite tool in this exhibition was a treadmill that had been conceived to attach to a butter churn and could be powered by a goat or farm dog. As you can imagine, a goat treadmill was extremely and entirely unexpected in a conversation about dairy products and as such grab the imagination and curious curiosity of visitors of all ages. I would be remiss if I did not mention the additional stroke of genius by the staff to then have a daily demonstration in our visitor kitchen on how to bake and of course taste the apple cake as visitors pondered at the amount of time and energy that would have gone into each ingredient in the 1880s. Another example of a tool or equipment that resonates is in the recently opened Soil Superheroes display. This exhibition looks at the invisible superpowers at work in healthy soil. While a vibrant group of superheroes tells their story in the exhibition, this pesticide sprayer, when paired with the image of bearskin farmers and students exposed to the harsh chemicals, suddenly transforms this vintage tool into a dangerous accessory that could have been slung across my own grandfather's chest as he worked his farm in the 1950s. Using this tool to tell the story about our evolving knowledge of soil management also introduces conversations about hazardous practices, materials and chemicals on farms and agricultural research stations, which is a legacy that keeps on giving as our conservation team and curators continue to find new ways to manage the risk of residues such as arsenic in our collection. The Canada Agriculture and Food Museum also has the benefit of being caretakers for over 150 animals. Having these demonstration herds affords us the opportunity to demonstrate the use of both modern and antique tools which relate to the national collection. Take for example our sheep shearing festival. The museum team installed a display case in the sheep and goat barn to showcase wool shearing tools beside the animals that are shorn and the visitor experience staff worked with a professional shearer to demonstrate the skill required to use some of the original hand pieces and inventions compared to the electric clippers used today. School children in the audience were asked if they would rather have Ross trim their hair with a hand crank machine or the contemporary clippers. The cheers for the clippers were the loudest. The Canada Agriculture and Food Museum is committed to encouraging the use of all five senses as part of each visitor's experience. The premise that many of us retain new information best when we are able to touch or manipulate an object is used to great advantage through interactives and by incorporating the daily farm operations into the experience. For example, looking at a honey extractor as an interesting piece of history or technology would likely interest most of the participants in this Congress. But asking visitors to take turns on a prop extractor to exclude a viscous oil that simulates honey suddenly takes on a whole new dimension for young audiences. Similarly, the museum works with our herds people, veterinarian and contractors to let the visitors touch the tools being used that day. A highlight for visitors lucky enough to attend on herd health day are often past the ultrasound visor by our veterinarian as he encourages them to see how he determines pregnancy pro progress with some of our dairy herd. Thank you for your attention. My coordinates are attached to the slide if you would like to share examples from your work. Merci. Hello everyone. I'm Bob Powell, or as my good friend Ed Schultz from Colonial Williamsburg calls me, trusty old horseman. I have been retired eight years, latterly from the 90-acre Highland Folk Museum here in Scotland. 
My lifetime and career has been associated with agriculture in different forms. And so, for this short presentation, I've put together a series of random, very random, thoughts or questions regarding working with agricultural collections. For my first couple of slides, I thought that I would reflect on who and what influenced me. This is as much to pose a question about from where will future agricultural curators come from and who will mentor them. As shown, my first slide is entitled To work with agricultural collections, you have to know about them, be interested and determined. My associated life began when, age two, I got my first horse brasses, and I have been obsessed ever since with working horses and farming. Age 14 in 1968, I learned to drive on a Ferguson TE20 tractor, and associated with the soil, the same year I went on my first archaeological dig. I graduated in archaeology because museum opportunities for agriculture were rare. Historic farming was my aim, and in 1979 I even ploughed the archaeological site I was working on. Still determined, by 1982 I became vice chairman of the Peterborough Farm Machinery Preservation Society, and I had enough experience to start on my own agriculturally related museums career. This slide is self explanatory. It shows three of the great old school farming mentors that I had. I was very fortunate, for I had the best of mentors, but the question I pose is where will future mentors come from? I have entitled this slide as Working in the sense of curatorial with documented and housed collections, but there's also working in the living history or open air museums profession. I'm trying here to emphasize the importance of the living history part of the museums profession. And for here, three thoughts. Firstly, where will the experienced staff come from? I was fortunate and had a fulfilling career working with some great colleagues, not necessarily museum trained, but older people with real agricultural and craft experience. These people have mostly either died or retired without passing on their knowledge and skills. Secondly, how do we encourage young people to be interested and support them? We have to engage with young people through offering family and educational programs at our institutions. However, I also believe that more could be offered through museum studies training. In my time, I found that the professional bodies were too glass case orientated and even dismissive of living history or open air museums, where our working with collections practices clashed with their ethics and standards. Thirdly, we need more practical museum staff as much as academic. I belong to the UK Museums Association, unusually in 1987, writing my AMA thesis on keeping livestock in museums. However, by 1993, I had become a member of the Association for Living History, Farm and Agricultural Museums, ALFAM because it really addressed my needs and interests. And now, similarly, I further support the aspirations of Amy. I said that my thoughts were random, and so, tangible agricultural collections are not just, as I would say tongue in cheek, scrap iron. If a zoo's creatures are considered a collection, then so should museum livestock. Here I want to highlight the potential breadth of skills required for an agricultural curator. Livestock not only complement established agricultural collections and activities, but further inform on how they are related. As with working agricultural practices in a museum setting, they require staff with practical knowledge and skills. 
people who can relate to and strike a balance between both historic and present day standards and regulations. My question is, do any curatorial programs include such training? And now, a fairly controversial comment, and one that I shall return to. Should we be using historic implements and machinery? Who knows how to use them? The breakdown, the wear out, spares are hard to find. Potentially, museum agricultural collections are often threatened through closures, deaccessioning, and lack of knowledge or interest. Who knows who has what? The UK Rural Museums Network surveys are now somewhat dated. Are agricultural working collections properly accessioned in spite of their potential destruction? Worn out or broken, they still may be unique or rare and worthy of exhibition after use. And now, further controversy. Why not tractors and associated machinery? Some years ago, I realized that visiting farm folk increasingly did not know what the horse hearer implements on view were. And yet they strained to see the two everyday working 1960s Massey Ferguson 135 tractors that we try to keep out of public view. This year, then for the Alfam virtual plowing match, we added a tractor category, but sadly nobody entered. Therefore, leaving aside environmental issues, tractors have been on farms for over a hundred years. They exist in museums' collections. As observed, Knowledge of older farming culture has waned, but tractors still engender nostalgia and interest, especially now for the 1960s, 1970s and 1980s. Older tractors are still associated with skills to use them, skills that still may be lost. My question then is, are rural museums too stuck in the pre-combustion engine periods associated with the nostalgia of the time from when they were founded, and therefore they do not truly represent agricultural history as a whole. Until now, I'd never considered this question. Is museum development a threat to agricultural interpretation and collections? When I started at the 90 acre Highland Folk Museum in 1997, we grew oats, barley, turnips, potatoes, and hay, and had a Clydesdale horse, beef shorthorn cattle, black faced sheep, and poultry. As we, or I, added more buildings, it diminished the farmland. Even the 2013 Amfasca Collections and Research Facility that protects the agricultural collections wiped out a field. Now, other than token sheep and seasonal borrowed highland cattle, there is no farming or agricultural equipment in use. And so, mixing a horse plough, a 1960s tractor and school children to plant potatoes, but, and back to, must we use historic artifacts for work? Are there modern alternatives that can still do the job and yet fulfill interpretation whilst protecting historic collections? And from our final random thought, a question about the way forward. We have potential opportunities to engage with new audiences by relating our sometimes vulnerable historic collections and sites to sustainable agriculture, food production, and a greener environment. For example, exhibit historic items, but consider preserving them by using comparative modern implements, such as the Cassine multi-tool that includes plows and cultivators. Such implements still demonstrate the same processes and skills 
and may be used for hands-on activities, including educational programs. We should have greater international cooperation and be less isolated in our outlook, as we have more in common regarding our tangible and intangible culture than our perceived differences. We should also engage in new activities and initiatives, such as Klaus Krop's recent Draft Animals Conference or his new A Year on the Field project that brings us from across the world and all aspects of our agricultural heritage and future together. Thank you. Thank you everyone for amazing presentation. Some really thought provoking uh, stuff going on there. Um, really amazing stuff. I was struck there by our uh, common threads of um, animals creeping into a session that should have been about material culture. Um, and that idea of uh, non-human animals as somehow part and parcel of the, the conversations that we should be having uh, about the agricultural heritage that we all care for. So we had uh, sheep milking uh, creeping into Hugh's presentation as, as well as other uh, aspects of that, the, the fantastic draft animal goats from Kerry Lee. And I'm struck by that machine. I want to see that and I want to see it in action. Uh, and, and I recognize some lovely black faced ewes as well as many other uh, animals in the lineup from Bob. So I wonder if you could each start by reflecting on the role of living uh, heritage within this world of sort of inanimate material culture that we care for and look after. A few more reflections on that. Um, perhaps you'd like to start, Kerry Lee, and we'll move on to Bob and then Hugh. Happy to. Uh, thank you, Ollie. Um, absolutely. Uh, we're very fortunate uh, at the Canada Agriculture and F Food Museum, as I said, to, to have uh, several demonstration herds. We're, we're very quick to say uh, that we are not uh, a typical uh, farm. Certainly, uh, no farm would stay in business the way we're farming with 200,000 visitors traipsing through. Uh, however, we do consider, uh, especially the rare breeds, uh, when we talk about genetics and, and trying to uh, ensure that some of those traits are carried on, um, that we do consider them living artifacts, that we do consider them uh, part of a, a, an ongoing um, story that we're telling through the animals that we're presenting. Um, another great example of a, a temporary display that we had up, we had our... our um, our dear uh, Hereford Bull, uh, Goody, that we had had for many, many, many years. Uh, he was uh, quite uh, prolific uh, throughout his career and, and lived to a, a very ripe old age. Uh, but he was very typical of, of the, the breed at the time. Um, and the tool that was on demonstration, uh, believe it or not, was a, a back scratcher uh, for him. It was meant uh, to demonstrate uh, ongoing um, care of the animal and some of the tools that were being used on contemporary sites um, you know, to keep the animal brushed, to keep them in good condition. Uh, and when we had our new Hereford bull uh, come in to take his place after he um, passed of natural causes, the difference between the, the, the height of the brush that, was being, that had been installed between uh, Goody and Hercules was over 18 inches. Uh, shorter. Uh, and we use that opportunity to talk about the tool and the difference in, in the breeds and, and the living aspect of our um, displays and, and exhibitions to talk about the, the changes in the breed, the fact that uh, beef cattle are, are not known for having steaks on their legs. And as such, uh, the, the, the intentional um, breeding and changes in that genetic stream um, were discussed and, and became a topic of conversation for, for the audiences over the, the few months until we uh, put that down because Hercules was getting quite uh, upset with us that he couldn't <laughs> could not in fact reach it. Um, so I, I hope that gives an example, definitely having the animals on site um, when we're working uh, with them, when we have opportunities, as I said, to talk about the tools, to talk about the equipment, uh, to talk about the changes in, in not only the tools, but th that the tools have changed because the breeds uh, and the genetics have changed uh, over time. Um, it, it certainly becomes part of a rich experience and why uh, our visitors never never have the same uh, experience twice. 
Thank you, Kerry Lee. And it's worth noting that Kerry Lee's museum does a wonderful job of uh, tweeting out content about their, uh, their many uh, living exhibits. So it's worth following them on Twitter if you're on social media. Bob, I wonder whether you could pick up on that. You made a very strong argument in favour of treating living heritage as part and parcel of that wider museum practice. And, and I, I got hints of a slight critique of, of certain object focused and glass case focused traditionalists uh, who, who perhaps would shy away from, from work in the field. So I wonder whether you could pick up on that, particularly with relation to the animals. Well, I, I think for me, you know, it's there's many different dimensions to us, like as Kerry Lee was saying, to having livestock on site. You know, we can look at the scientific side and breed preservation. But for me, it's the many different aspects come from the interpretation on site, the chance to interact with visitors, um, and the life the animals bring to a site. So I think of, you know, when I was at the museum and at that time we had Rosie or Clydesdale, the difference that having, you know, a real horse and then the real stables made to that aspect, the fact that, you know, we could explain the seasons through the year, you know, depending on when we had the lambs shearing, um, you know, the same with the calves. And, you know, it's, it was another aspect as well for the staff to have uh, opportunities to particularly to interact with visitors who had no contact with livestock before. I mean, I think the one thing that specifically sticks out in my mind was we got in some, I had some Tamworth pigs for a couple of years. And as I always remember this young lady in her 20s coming from Glasgow and it was her sheer amazement. She'd never seen a pig in her life. So it's even some of those most basic opportunities that say just gives a very greater dimension. But then like as Kerry Lee was saying, you know, when you can relate livestock to the objects that you actually have on the site or in different scenarios, it, it just brings everything to life and enhances the whole uh, interpretation. Thank you, Bob. And Hugh, picking up on that in connection with your work with uh, students who are potentially going to be that next generation of uh, curators, historians working with, with rural heritage material, um, I wonder whether you could just come in here on uh, the degree to which you work with living history as part of the, de the courses that you run, but also some of the other forms of evidence. So I recognize that uh, what I would call a sheep stale from my Scottish borders, sheep farming background. I'm probably one of the few people who's worked in one of those dry stone wall sheep stales uh, when I was sort of much younger. But how much uh, does that hands-on experience play a part in things? And, and is that an enriching part of that, that sort of master's education? Well, um, what we enjoy in our course, um, which I should say is a master's program at postgraduate level, is always challenging conventional academic approaches. So uh, what I've found with uh, our students is that um, I'm quite brazen about the material culture term. And that's always slightly nerve wracking for our students beginning that. But many of them have links with the countryside or particularly with crofting communities. And because it's all mediated through Scottish Gaelic, lots of um, perhaps the people from outside have quite a good knowledge of crofting agriculture because they've studied the highlands and islands in one way or another. So we try to um, bring that to life in different ways, like um, teaching our students to what I like to call read the landscape, understanding the signs of what's happened and the changes that have taken place that we can see around us in a deserted countryside, but also um, bringing out the character of crofting agriculture and how that has changed or is changing and how um, we can get help, ready help from people who are crofting in the island of Skye and really do enjoy helping us um, or else I'm a, an unpopular taskmaster but they seem to, uh, we have very good conversations and they enjoy talking to our students about uh, techniques and the round of the seasons and all the work of crofting. And so in that respect, we get a good um, living history, if you like, um, 
exposure, but um, also with the reality check that this is all taking place and that we have still an important segment of society that are both knowledgeable and enthusiastic about animal husbandry and about um, the relevant um, uh, tillage techniques that might still be used um, both with machinery but, but by hand and in other words spade agriculture on small plots. Thank you very much Hugh. I think Kerry Lee you would like to come in on that. I, I would, and, and I should say, uh, originally my, my presentation was a little longer and I was ruthless and, and chopped off a couple of <laughs> um, minutes off the end, but I would be remiss if I didn't pick up on what he was saying in, um, with, a, with a learning collection. Uh, and so the, the museum is, is, is part of a, um, the National Museums of Science and Innovation, and as such, we have a, a collection uh, and a program uh, entitled um, Reading Artifacts, the Reading Artifacts Institute. Uh, Bob was um, you know, speaking to who, who will be the next mentors or who will inspire the next generation of, of museum curators or historians. Uh, that has been opened up not only to uh, researchers or historians, but also uh, teachers, um, curious Canadians that want to come in. They're, they're given an object um, without a lot of context, and they're asked to research it based on uh, you know, the, the materials used, the wear on it, uh, it could even be the color of the time, um, but that has been an incredibly rich experience when we look at how to um, translate between the, the collection for collecting, for collecting purposes uh, that might be something that we can't operate, but we certainly can use that to help inform and, and ensure that these conversations happen. We're finding uh, as more of the population becomes further and further removed from the source of their food production or their, you know, the, the bio products that we all depend on, uh, that, that using the collection in that way has also become uh, incredibly rich for engaging not only new audiences, but also new partners in the telling of the story and the ongoing uh, education and research. I'm just going to uh, quickly mention that we have, I'm, I'm sorry to say, run over uh, by about five minutes. I just want to ask one quick final question, and it's sort of picking up on the fact that I saw Bob had a lovely image of him as a child, uh, and we've all sort of referenced some of the, the, the background that we have coming into this, and we're talking about the next generation coming in. I'll show you a photo of me sitting on my father's lap. That's my father, who was a, a boarders farmer. I just happen to have that beside me. Um, so I'm, I'm thinking about who we are and our own positionality here. Um, Kerry Lee made some really powerful uh, statements about the placement of the museum on Indigenous land in uh, an Algonquin First Nations sort of community environment. Um, and Hugh mentioned the, the Highland clearances. So I'm thinking about um, the social backgrounds and social intersections, as well as those snapshots in time. I think objects and heritage can be sort of social intersections in time. So I wonder if you could each pick up on who you think should be the next uh, generation of agricultural museum curators and why, and try and be very pithy uh, when you do. Um, do you want to go first, Bob? I think I think it's sort of that's, it's a real real challenging issue. Um, we, we we still very much need traditional curators, and I, I'd like to see almost like a step back in time to I'm sure like when Hugh was at the NMS. You know, we had the country life section, we had country life specialists, uh, curators who could really study their collections and were generalists. But at the same time, I mean, I know Pete will be talking tomorrow, will be talked from uh, Pete about how he's going out, goes or has been going for a number of years out into the community and work, you know, taking the oxen, working at schools and engaging widely with the communities around. And, and I think somehow more of our next generation has actually got to come from within the different communities that we have around us and encourage those people to relate what they're going through in the present day and somehow make that real connection to what we have in the past. So that, um, you know, there's not a disconnect between, uh, so we say the urban and rural communities. It's not as simple as that, but I, th I think that's where we have to go. We have to look at diff different peoples and how we get them involved. Brilliant, thank you. We've got about a minute left, Hugh. So 30 seconds and then on. Sorry. <laughs> Well, my my own our own course at Selmorostig um, is has perhaps grown out of 
my own feeling to uh, to educate a, a future generation of curators because uh, certainly in my time um, we were seeing the shrinking of the number of staff in these say in a national museum who could be um, allocated agricultural history and social and economic history of the countryside, let alone language, uh, th these teams shrunk. And now um, my feeling is that there isn't such a specialist group of people who are able to answer these questions that uh, we were answering. And so I'm trying to take these qu questions and topics forward and talk about them as widely as I can amongst um, the, um, the, the, the up and coming generations and uh, those, of the, those coming out of degree courses. Brilliant, thank you. And very quickly, uh, Kerry Lee, in a nutshell, I'll let you have the, far, the last word for our session, uh, but thank you, uh, thank you all very much. I'm honored, thank you. Uh, the museum is uh, currently uh, involved in a very exciting phase where we're doing more and more co-curation and, and that's pairing up um, what we would call traditional industry experts, so historians, agronomists, uh, with social scientists or working with knowledge keepers, uh, working with um, you know, diverse audiences that perhaps interpret um, the, the products, but also the tools in very different ways. And so this idea of co-curation, co-creation of content and research uh, is really exciting and I think much richer um, benefiting from that. Thank you very much. And thank you to all our uh, part, uh, speaker participants in this session, over, you, over to you, Isabel. Yes, can I add my thanks as well? And thank, thanks to Ollie too, because he, he stepped in to cover um, the, the chairing of this session, uh, which should have been um, Lisa Harris, who sent her apologies. She's at the Museum of English, um, East Anglian Life, not English Rural Life, that's us, East Anglian Life. Uh, anyway, um, in, we, ha we will have a 10 minute break this time. And during that break, we will show one of Lisa's films, which is called Search for the Star. And it's about their digitization project. So a 10 minute break, please. And then we'll reconvene for the final session today. Thank you. is our digitization project here at the museum. We are taking all of our record cards and um, all on online um, collection management system. So we're taking this information and putting it on a program called eHive. Um, the reason for doing this is to get it all online so we know what we've got in our collection so the public can view the collection through the website but also it gives us an opportunity to go through every object one by one and to highlight any star objects that we come across. So, be anything that's interesting people. And this is a big volunteer powered um, project. Hello, I'm Lizzie, and I've been a remote volunteer with the Museum of East Anglian Life since January. The main thing that I've been involved in is the Search for Stars project, helping to transfer the museum's old object record cards onto an online searchable catalogue. I've often been involved in doing further research into some of the museum's most interesting objects. I really enjoy volunteering with the museum. I'm in between study at the moment, and as I want to work in the museum sector myself, it gives me a great opportunity to further develop my skills. Um, I signed up for the Search for Stars um, volunteer project when I was furloughed from my current role. Um, I have always been in study, I've always been in work, I've never really had a period of unemployment, so um, the, I guess the prospect of suddenly finding out that I might not be back in for a really long time was quite daunting. Um, so I was trying to find something to do and came across the Search for Stars research project with um, Museum of East Anglian Life and got in touch and started taking part um, in that over lockdown. Um, it was a massive help for me in terms of giving me something to do every day, kind of meaning that I could maintain some sort of routine and meaning that I was still challenging myself a little bit, as well as obviously things to do with, you know, finding out more about the museum's collections was really interesting.
Hi, I'm Eve, and I'm a collections trainee here at the museum. Hi, I'm Ronna, I'm also a collections trainee here at the museum. Today we're working on the Shooting Stars project, and we have um, volunteers here uh, working on site, and this project um, hopes to get all of our collection photographed so that this can be uploaded online um, as a digital record so that we know what they look like, um, but also so the public can have better access to our collection. We've had volunteers working on the project since its start and they make a, a really important part of what we do and make and they help us to photograph everything that we have. So we've been working on our objects in the small object store and the large object store. Um, and we're at a point now where we can recruit even more volunteers so we can photograph even more objects. Welcome back to our final session for today. Uh, I'm very pleased to introduce my colleague Guy Baxter, who's Associate Director and Head of Archives here at the Museum of English Rural Life. Again, I will repeat um, the instructions. Please uh, have your, your cameras off and your microphones off and uh, any presentations that uh, my, you might see will also be uh, put in the chat in on via you and, and they're on YouTube and you can uh, get an automatic translation that way and we also strongly encourage any questions to come through the chat so I'd like to pass over at this point to Guy thank you thank you Isabel so our final session today is agriculture and the digital museum and it's my pleasure to introduce our keynote speaker Adam Kazari so Adam was formerly the program manager and digital lead at the Museum of English Rural Life, and he achieved viral internet fame, I think we can only call it that, by tweeting a photograph of a large ram. Now, one hears a lot of talk these days about social media influencers, and usually this means people who get paid to go to nightclubs and post on Instagram, but Adam, certainly in my view, is a true social media influencer, and he's done more than most to help museums to connect to new online audiences. And that's because Adam is someone who genuinely understands museums, who comes from museum background and, and, and has been involved in the work of museums for many years. Adam will be the first to recognise, though, that he's followed on from work that other people have done and that hopefully museums will take inspiration from his work in turn to stretch their own practice within this area. So Adam has pre-recorded his talk, although I see he is, he is with us live as well for the Q&A afterwards. Uh, and so for, uh, we, I will hand over to uh, Adam's presentation and then he'll be joining us live to answer questions following that. Hello, and welcome to my talk from Farm Museum to absolute units. This is a pre-recorded talk and I'll be going very slowly so that I can hit the 30 minute mark after which there'll be questions. I won't be offended if you make a cup of tea, put Star Wars on in the background or pick who knows because I cannot see you. Also welcome to my house. I'd love if we'd be able to be doing this in person but instead you gave me and my very messy shelving in the background. To introduce myself, I'm Adam Kazari, and I live in Reading, which if you don't know, Reading is the largest town in England. It's famous for a festival, for confusing book lovers the world over, um, a local man that we call Reading Elvis, and the invention of the biscuit tin. But Reading is probably most famous to a select group of people for being the home of the Museum of English Rural Life, a part of the University of Reading, which I'll now refer to as the Mel, even though saying its full name would definitely get me to that half hour mark. 
So in 2018, the museum had already had an interesting couple of years. Alongside people much, much smarter than me, some of whom were part of this conference, I worked on the redevelopment of the entire museum, which reopened to the public in 2016. After that, Arts Council England gave us funding for a digital transformation project, looking at digital skills, new technologies, and how to make the most out of our website and social media. It was at the tail end of this project, when I was sat in my office um, on Twitter, searching our archive for an image relevant to International Unicorn Day, in that time-honoured tradition of shoehorning museum objects into tangentially relevant hashtags on social media, which is when I came across this absolute unit, which is what I then tweeted, and it eventually achieved around 30,000 retweets and over 100,000 likes on Twitter. I think I first realised this was kicking off when I was on a bathroom break and texting my colleague at the time, our marketing manager, Alison Hilton, saying that something might be kicking off and then spending the rest of the evening on my train ride home and eating a curry with my laptop on my lap, desperately dealing with the situation. Now, if that phrase absolute unit makes no sense to you, it was inspired by this original tweet of a large man standing next to the queen. The phrase absolute units essentially means an impressively large person or animal, which this sheep definitely was. It can be seen a bit like fat shaming, but we only ever used it in a very celebratory way because this sheep is just very impressive by its size. And it was that size because it was bred both for mutton and for its fleece, um, making it especially large. The image is of an Exmoor horn ram taken in 1962 at the Devon Show and was featured in the Farmer and Stock Breeder Journal, which the Merle Archive now looks after. The success of this tweet, though, was not normal for a museum like the Museum of English Rural Life. We did not tend to go viral, um, but in many ways it made sense. People on the internet like the quirky, the unexpected, and they really like funny things. And a small, mu a small English museum about rural life being under the viral spotlight was almost as entertaining as a tweet itself. I never expected, for instance, to be in conversations with people called Lil Swamp Ass on Twitter, but this kind, this, this viral moment created a lot of new opportunities for meeting new people. But nevertheless, there was a large element of right place, right time, right content. But luckily we knew how to take advantage of it. Our director, Kate, trusted us to build on the original tweets. We could have left it running just as it was and it probably would have done okay, but I don't think it would have done as well if we didn't have that freedom to then have funny conversations with people or adding new memes and essentially milking this meme for all it was worth. We did call the sheep Steve, but it didn't really catch on. Colleagues at the Mold also jumped in, whether it was exploring the original journal the sheep featured in, in the archives, going on a bit of an adventure, writing a blog on animal genetics to explain why the sheep was so big and giving it a bit of context, and also creating t-shirts which were shipped across the world. I believe the Mold has just released a new range of shirts, as well as mugs and other things as well, if you go to their shop on their website. We also then introduced all of our new followers to the museum in the same tone, explaining that actually we weren't just a meme account, but a real museum, because we had a ton of new followers who only knew us because of that sheep. But it was quite important to us to say, yes, but there's also this, this entire building and collection and lots of other things that you should come and see and get excited about. And when you see incredibly popular posts on social media, these viral posts, you'll also notice that the people who make them don't necessarily have a lot of followers. And I believe we managed to add thousands of new followers because it was clear that we had a lot more to offer if people followed us and that it wasn't just a one-off. Its legacy means it now has a page on knowyourmeme.com. It got into the newspapers. 
Um, Elon Musk talked about it and offered me a job at Tesla because of it. Um, but that's a story you'll have to hear if you buy me three pints, I think. And three years on, it's fair to say I'm a little bit sick of the whole thing. But it was still an amazing experience for the museum. And luckily it wasn't a one-off. The tweets and its tone inspired future content from the mall. We had further viral successes involving a journal where a child doodled a picture of a chicken in trousers. I think it was a 17th century journal. And we had a story of a bat that got stuck in our archives. We even got the university to give it a library card. And we took the opportunity to teach people about the migration of bats from Eastern Europe and the impact of climate change, which comes in. Uh, this is where it's very handy to have someone on staff, a volunteer in this case, who also happens to volunteer for a bat conservation trust. We also taught people um, how to identify a bat by looking at its genitalia. Apparently a male has genitalia that's like an albino hedgehog, which is fun. Uh, Joe Vaughan, who currently runs a social media, has since built on this success to reach new heady heights. And the results mean that our Twitter following grew from about 10,000 to over 130,000 by the time I left the museum. And I think it's now on about 155,000, which is bigger than pretty much all regional museums like big city museums in the UK. It's only really the national museums who beat us on Twitter followers. With that, with that becomes a bigger profile, more people know about the museum. We also have tourists and you've got to imagine Tourists, they might only have a week in the UK to explore all that it has to offer, all the sightseeing and history of London, to the spires of Oxford, to the musical heritage of Manchester, going to Edinburgh, Cardiff, uh, Lake District, Stonehenge, Salisbury's famous spire. And instead, they were dedicating one of their precious days, taking the train to visit Reading and the Museum of English Royal Life on the strength of one tweet about a sheep which I still find kind of insane, but the comments they left in our visitor book were just heartwarming to read. But one of the most important lessons from the tweet was something we had actually been shouting about for some time already. And that is that social media is it's not about broadcasting and telling people things. It's not like putting an advert in the paper or having a leaflet where people can't talk back to you. It's about having conversations and it's also about giving people what they want, which is usually something interesting and amusing. In the Mills case, we used humour and conversation as the gateway drug to that most life-wrecking of addictions, rural history. Because galleries, libraries, archives and museums are used to controlling their own spaces. For the most part, we decide what to put on the walls and to dictate the experience of a visit. We can run community co-curation, we can do visitor surveys, but for the mass, vast majority of visitors, they come, they read the label, they enjoy all their don'ts, they might have a cup of tea and they leave. But there's very little opportunity for interaction, for having a conversation with staff and sharing their own experiences. I often found myself wanting to be, to go down into the galleries and kind of stand behind people as they read the interpretation and then ask them what they thought and ask if they had any more questions. Um, and then again, it's extremely rare that people would also be able to experience the vast amounts of material that we hold in storage, of which the absolute unit photograph of that sheep was one. It has since been put on display because of this campaign. But that's not to say that we do a bad job of on-site interpretation. We all do fantastic jobs, particularly considering the medium that we're working with, but we simply can't be everywhere at once to have that dialogue with visitors. I always feel like a tour guide for every visiting group would be the ideal um, scenario in a museum, but that's just impossible. On social media, however, we do have more of an opportunity to have that dialogue, but we also don't have a captive audience in the same way we do when someone enters a museum. We don't dictate the experience on social media. They can take it or leave it because social media is intended to build connections between people and also obviously to mine their data for advertising and for tracking. Um, but that's a whole other conversation. 
And museums, frankly, are not people. We are not particularly anyone's friends unless we make an effort to come across as friends. We are interlopers on people's time and interests. And people don't, re don't usually log on and say, oh, I wanna, I wanna know exactly this thing about rural history. They're logging on to see the latest memes about the Euros Cup or for Love Island. I don't know if um, people abroad might get the reference of Love Island, but if you Google it, you'll get a pretty clear idea of what that show is. So people, I mean, people are invariably on social media to learn something new and waste time. Having a museum account pop up and tell you what a bill hook is, is rarely what people need, I would say. I would be interested, but it's, it's a niche group. It's simply a different context to our galleries. And it's far easier to just ignore museums on social media. Whereas it's more of a conscious decision to both visit and leave and interact with a physical museum. And talking to people in the same way we do with our gallery labels will only get us so far. We can't just copy and paste that interpretation onto the internet and expect it to work in that context. And in particular for rural museums, we simply have to work harder than other museums particularly the museums in the UK, full of things that we've looted and pillaged from across the world. They might have big name artists, jazzy international exhibitions. We have wagons, um, which means we need to tell our most interesting stories to engage in conversation and also leave some room for pure fun and entertainment just to compete. Because museums, I mean, I say museums are not people, but they are staffed by people. When people think of the museum, they think of bricks and mortar, of the objects, of their memories of visiting. They don't necessarily always think of it as a friendly face. I mean, I'm generalizing, but in general, that is the perception. So we need to make it clear that there are humans behind our social media and to tell our stories authentically. And the trick is packaging the deep knowledge and enthusiasm of our staff, the contents of our collections, in a way that achieves our objectives without people ignoring us on social media. And we do this by teasing out the emotive core of the stories we have to tell, by reacting to online trends to make sure we're relevant and sometimes telling jokes. But you also then need to sneak in the deeper history and context, the mission led part of what we do um, in kind of a way like burying the lead, but not necessarily all of the time. Essentially, we need to understand that we need to adapt to social media and how people consume content rather than the other way around. And that's not just putting something up and saying, you should consume it and enjoy this piece of content because we're a museum and we say so. Because people are seeking authenticity, novelty, and anything which holds their interests. And ultimately, that's what the Absolute Unit tweet taught us. And it taught us to ignore our fatalism. I don't, pretend to speak for everyone who works in rural museums, obviously. But for me, there was always a sense that we were for a niche audience, that it would be impossible to appeal to a broader public with what we had to offer. But actually, <clears throat> excuse me, people <coughs> are interested. They're interested in how their ancestors worked and lived. They're interested in how to live sustainably using the lessons from the past and the present. Where our food comes from, our traditions, our stories, and our big sheep. God, no idea why I didn't bring you a glass of water for this. Um, very often it's not the stories, it's, it's not that people aren't interested in the stories we have to tell, it's they're not interested in how we're choosing to tell them. And actually, the bar isn't as high as you might think. Like you might, you might think, oh, God, we need to become master storytellers. We have to create all these dazzling, highly produced videos or articles or spend hours and hours on single posts. But the bar isn't as high as that. I saw this video last week on reddit.com. If you don't know what Reddit is, it's where users submit videos and pictures and links and the community votes them up or down depending on whether they like it or not. And it was a video simply showing all the different parts of a working water-powered sawmill in Canada, part of a museum, 
and it had over 8,000 upvotes and dozens of people in the comments asking what the belts were made of, how much horsepower it has, and how often they change the swords. Now, I'm actually part of a, um, a watermill Facebook group, which definitely felt like a community talking to itself. But I think sometimes we forget that most people don't have the experience of the things that we take for granted in our museums. And there is an appetite for our content if we can get it across simply but effectively. But what's often holding us back are the classics of anything that holds us back in our work. It's through having the right resources, it's having the infrastructure in place, it's the training, but it's also having the right people. It's also simply how we communicate. Because other museums have had success with this type of more lighthearted content, there are places like Yorkshire Museums Trust who've been using their collections to react to trending memes, <clears throat> like this one with Bernie Sanders. And they've also been running their popular curator battles on Twitter, where they encourage other museums and museum workers to share objects and stories based on the theme. Normal people have also been using objects and artworks for their own memes, particularly um, classical artworks, um, though annoyingly they rarely credit their sources. So what I'm saying is there is a way to use our collections in this way, but not all of us necessarily know how to do it properly. And I'm not saying be funny, because that's honestly one of the most terrifying commands you can ever be given. Because sure, fun and funny content is nice. It might get you more followers, it achieves its purpose. But you still need to pursue your whole mission. You need a diversity of content, um, but it needs a human voice. And one thing I always tell people is to write their posts in the same style as they would explain something to someone in person, to keep that authenticity and enthusiasm. And while fun and funny content is an important part of the mix, it shouldn't be everything that we do. We still need to discuss serious issues facing the world and communicate complex research topics. Sustainability and how we farm are integral to not just the economy, but also how we tackle climate change and how we adapt to our changing world. A museum also needs to convince people to visit. We need to survive on visitor income and use our services. We also need to inspire them with our content. We need to keep them entertained as well as to educate them. But this diversity of content can never be the job of just one person. A social media manager sits between the public and the organisation, so they know what is trending and interesting to people on the internet, but they need help in adapting what's relevant in the museum to the internet. And in places which can't afford someone dedicated to producing that content, which let's face it, is pretty much everyone. It's the job of people working directly with collections and the public to adapt their knowledge and enthusiasm for the internet. We're almost getting to the stage where digital responsibilities can't just be siloed in one person or department. It's part of everyone's job now. And that requires a whole organization working together understanding its own strengths and weaknesses and having the right infrastructure and skills to know what content to create and perhaps more importantly, what not to create. And there's this misconception that it has to be everything or nothing that we need to post every day or that every post has to be a massive success. We look at museums like the Black Country Living Museum on TikTok with over 1 million followers. I think they're the most followed museum on TikTok. But we forget that all they did was play to their strengths. They have a cast of paid and volunteer actors on their site, and they have a marketing manager who understands TikTok as a platform and how to adapt the museum to it. Now, Ava Museum has those circumstances and they can't achieve what the Black Country Living Museum has done, but neither should they, because we, we each have our own unique selling points, which might be suitable for another form of content, for a different channel. We don't all have to do the same thing because it's worked for someone else in the same way that I wouldn't expect every single museum to start tweeting about big sheep, but it does actually still work pretty well, to be fair. But behind the absolute unit tweet was some critical foundations. This by no means was just me and my baby. This was a whole museum effort because we'd already had the conversation with our archive colleagues 
um, about the ethical and proper use of collections. So we knew what images we could and could not use on social media. And this might be a privilege of having a bit of money and funding, but we exported our entire digitized collection to a digital asset management system where people could have different levels of access, where they could just view things, where they could download things. And our archive staff could tag collections for whether they, we could not use particular collections or images, whether could, because they were under copyrights or because there are ethical considerations, and which images they were essentially saying, use for social media, you don't need to check it with us. We're happy for you to use it in whatever way you see fit. And this, uh, this allowed us to avoid the usual friction between collections teams and people posting digital content, where people in digital content don't quite understand all the issues relating to collections. Collections don't necessarily always understand what works for digital content, um, is essentially establishing the ground rules and the red lines, and then operating within that framework. We'd also already built a network on social media we had nearly 10,000 followers on Twitter to begin with, which is a good number. And it meant that we had a network ready to share our content. Because without this pre-existing audience built up over many years, the tweet would have failed, pretty simply. You can have the best content in the world, but if your only follower is your mom, then it's not going to go anywhere. We also had a website ready, um, a website where we could easily write and publish blogs, and we had our colleagues trained in writing for web. We had a system essentially for writing and publishing content so that when the tweet kicked off, our curator Ollie could easily write and get an article up on the website very rapidly. But perhaps most importantly, we trusted each other. I'm not, I'm not breaking up with the emotion, that's just my throat again. Perhaps most importantly, we trusted each other. Our director trusted us to run with the tweets and to have the freedom to write it in the first place. Our archive colleagues trusted us to use the collection sensibly and all of our staff felt comfortable being part of that process. I mean, I, mean, I say they were comfortable, no process is ever perfect, but we, we at least had a way for getting content online and people were generally, people generally understood what we were trying to achieve. And actually, People tie themselves up in knots about digital content, but as a process, it is actually quite straightforward. We're all matching the strengths of our museums and collections to audience needs, and having that audience need in mind is crucial. It can't just be what the museum wants. It's meeting that need halfway. So we find stories, whether they're small stories or big stories, we turn those into tweets, Facebook posts, Instagram posts, articles, videos, podcasts, if you've got the resource. But in the end, it's all just text, images, video, and audio. In every museum, you can usually find someone who can write, you'd hope, someone who can take a photo, and someone who can edit an image. And if you can't, it is actually quite easy to learn. The trickier part is having someone who knows how to edit that text, how to build that story, and choose the content so that it matches the audience needs on social media. That's something that only comes from experience and practice. And also someone willing to waste their lives on social media to kind of understand how it ticks, which uh, is definitely a big ask, which is why it's easier to find someone who's already wasted their life rather than ask someone to waste their life. You might also think that you don't have any content. Like what? What do we use? How do we actually get something that's happening in the real world, in the real collections, on site, onto online? But you just need to take a minute and think about what your museum does and what could easily be turned into content. We often call this a content audit, like listing all the activities we do and coming up with ideas for how we turn that into something for online. There could be an engaging person on your staff with unlimited knowledge the kind of person who is always just giving you little tidbits of information in the kitchen or in the corridor. Who could just sit in front of a camera for TikTok or for Instagram Reels or Facebook Live even. The Carnegie Museum of Natural History in the USA literally just has a curator who tells snail jokes in among their other content and is wildly popular. 
in the UK, I can imagine a curator exploring regional dialects or explaining the agricultural roots of words like linchpin and kingpin and teenagers just lapping it up. There's a trend at the moment for finding things which you would think were uncool, but are actually quite cool, so long as they're honest and authentic. You could do a morning call if you have farm animals on your site. And Cane Hill Countryside Centre in the UK hosts a rush hour video every day where the farmer releases his animals into the yard, um, saying hello to them as they go, giving you a bit of information about them. And he's gone viral. And all he does is point a camera at some animals. You might have community groups you work with or specialists in heritage craft. You can collaborate with them to unload their skills and experience in articles, videos and posts. And in my job at the Royal Academy of Arts, we're constantly asking the shop and our community groups, um, who are you working with at the moment? And do they have content that we could easily post on our own channels that we could collaborate on? get them to do the work and then just fit it to your channels. And then there are digitized collections, which are the easiest posts imaginable. Just have the picture, have a bit of context, write it in an engaging way. You might even have film archives that are out of copyright, which you can post online. Where you go essentially depends on your museum because the skills for decent social media are kind of readily known. It's, it's all about editing an image, how to write, how to track the data, how to tell a story. But how can you harness the power of social media for your mission and organizational objectives? The key is to be ruthless. Very often we can fall into this trap of just writing things for ourselves. We think, oh, we need to tell people about this project. So we, we write an article or a post that reads like uh, internal reports. You need to focus only on what objectives you've agreed within your organization, but always ask of your content, does anyone care? Would I read this as an average person? Does that headline draw me in or will I scroll past? We are always just one post among many. We're posts competing with politics, with funny cat videos, people falling over, climate change. Everything is shouting in the world and it takes effort to get above that fray. And this is where doing good social media starts to affect the rest of the organization. You can't meet your goals if you don't know what your goals are. At the Merle, we use something called the objective first framework, where you first identify the objective and it doesn't need to be a digital objective. It could be to reach a new type of audience for a project. It could be to raise money, fundraising, and um, to digitize a collection or even just to keep the museum afloat. Or could just be to raise awareness of a project or a collection. Then we work backward to figure out how we measure the success of that objective, whether it's tracking revenue on the website and how much of it came from our campaign, whether it's changes in the social media audience demographics that we have, or if it's just classic reach and engagement of our posts. <clears throat> and then we brainstorm content ideas based on knowing the time and resources we have but really trying to draw the ideas out of people and have a no idea is a stupid idea kind of atmosphere. And also knowing what has worked in the past and what has worked and what hasn't to inform future ideas. It wasn't perfect, but it went some way to answering the questions, is this worth it? What are we actually achieving? Which is very easy to ask of social media. What is the point? It's a way of proving the point. You also can't build your digital skills or take advantage of them without knowing your gaps. Now, this is a bit of work, but at the Merle, we also ran a digital skills questionnaire, asking how confident staff were in everything from how to Google technical issues to producing videos or writing content for the website. And then we made a plan for filling in those gaps. And you shouldn't be afraid to ask for help and to experiment and to make mistakes because not, I mean, I've done social media now for national organisations and even they don't have everything together. They don't know exactly what to do all of the time. And we're all on the learning curve. We're all Googling YouTube videos to learn new skills, asking other people for their advice. But we need to do this work. 
because social media stopped being a fad years ago. You could even say 10 years ago. People are simply online now. It's as important as reaching people physically. It's where they find out new information. It's where they decide where they're going to visit on the weekend. And it's where they spend their money shopping. There are people out there who are interested in what we do. We simply need to be there, to be human, but also to be interesting. And what the absolute unit tweet taught us is that we don't have to be shy. People will engage and learn from rural museums and their collections, but we have to meet people halfway. We have to stop navel gazing and producing content that feels like it's made for other people already interested in rural museums and collections. We need to find a way of making it relevant to people who might not have thought they'd be interested in it. But behind that glib statement is a lot of work, I can't lie. But the core of it is starting with knowing what you want to do and achieve, and then working as a team to achieve it together. And part of that is to stop thinking of social media as an extra. Incorporate it into your work and your projects. Empower the people with the skills and the personalities to speak for your organisation on social media. And above all, have fun. You don't have to conquer the world straight away. Start small, take risks. You almost have nothing to lose. Thank you for listening to me. Thank you, Adam. That was uh, absolutely fascinating. And I know we're really pushed and you're really pushed for time. So um, if it's okay, we'll push straight into some, uh, into some questions. Um, Ollie, I'm going to take a liberty and I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to praise your question uh, somewhat. Um, so, uh, Adam, you talked a lot about taking what's in the physical museum and translating that to social media. Ollie's question flips that around, um, particularly post pandemic um, and, and all the changes that have, that, that have happened to how people think about the, the digital engagement and the, and the in person experience in the past 18 months. What can we take from social media to to change uh, to apply to our in-gallery interpretation? And Ollie suggests maybe humour. I think you might have already rejected that. Um, responsiveness, immediate relevance, or something else. Well, first of all, can you hear me? Okay. Yep. Cool. Okay. I'm actually sat at the bottom of Robert Burns's monument, uh, so I don't know how the Wi-Fi is going to go, or if I'm going to slip into Scots. But um, yeah, it's a uh, it is a tricky one because they are such different contexts. And I think most curators would actually like to be able to change exhibitions so that they're relevant week by week, month by month, year by year, as we can do on social media. Um, but because of resources, we're simply forced into doing the kind of museums that we have to, where they have to last five or 10 years. I think some people have tried like to insert social media elements into the museum, but I think people don't go to the museum to really have that kind of experience, unless you really sell the museum as that experience, is come in and we're gonna have a conversation and there's opportunities for you to really put your voice into the museum and send us your pictures and all the rest. But that takes a lot of work and it's a very different mode of operating to most museums that requires a lot of front of house staff, which we simply don't have. I don't think we'll ever, I think we can take some lessons in that. I don't think we do need to always be so formal in our interpretation. I think that's already been a trend. Um, I think we could be more playful with our graphics and how people understand information by making it more relatable than academic. But a more, there is also a space for academia and to be serious. I think it all depends on context. That's such a woolly answer. Thank you, Adam. I think I think um, actually Isabel's question sort of picks up on some of those themes because um, as well, but it also picks on some up on something that I wanted to ask, which was about sort of trustworthiness. Um, so, so she says, do you see an issue with the ephemeral nature of social media versus the museum with its permanent galleries and timeless presentation, and and, and that being perceived 
as unchanging and authentic and and trustworthy so i suppose there's a question is you know this, does the social media and the ephemerality of that slightly undermine that kind of trustworthiness i suppose is one thing or or is there a kind of a a, a happy medium here I, I i suppose i think so i think whenever we do social media it is a bit like doing a deal with the devil because there's already worries about all of this knowledge that is lost on social media because you post one day and then it's it's gone essentially and if you delete it it's gone forever and i think that is that's a very troubling thing for museums and the idea of data preservation digital preservation i know is really important for archives um i don't think we've really cracked that puzzle yet and i think it's why we need to make our websites as robust as possible because we should always really be drawing people back into the museum sites to the original source and to the collections so that while what's on social media is quite ephemeral it's always being drawn back to that source so people can actually find that deeper i wouldn't necessarily say timeless because i still think interpretation changes as society changes but it, it we need to be making sure that it's all coming back to that source of knowledge if that makes sense i've no idea if it does no no, no okay so so authenticity is what matters rather than sort of timelessness it it can be authentic it can something can be authentic but still change um i suppose can't it um yeah okay that that that's very interesting i wanted to ask about um about a, a bit about kind of the future and, and and the future of where social media might be might be heading um i mean are there are there trends at the moment i mean clearly instagram has been enormously you know enormously more successful than um than, than Twitter um, and obviously there are there are things happening you know in terms of um, uh, in terms of legislation around around social media as well that may be affecting things and, and maybe putting those those platforms under under pressure although hopefully at the end of the, at the sort of end of social media that museums don't get involved in in terms of abuse etc but I mean are, are there things happening in social media at the moment and trends that, that you think are going to be important for museums and particularly perhaps for, for rural and agricultural museums to consider? Well, I think disinformation is actually one of the biggest ones. The penny is finally dropping that a lot of, I mean, I think people have known this for years, but it's now just becoming too much of an issue. Thank you. Sorry, they're just closing the Robert Burns's memorial garden. <laughs> well, um, um, you, you've run up against the, an old-fashioned physical museum problem there, Adam. But I <laughs> Closing time. Apparently. Um, but yeah, I think people are just, they're kind of realising that it's a serious issue, even though there's always, they've always known it, that it's there. And I think actually there's a space for trusted organisations. I think you already see with the verification, but I think there might be a trend to actually say this is much more of a trusted source. And as Twitter's been doing, flagging people that aren't trusted sources. So people would be looking actually more to museums, which we already know the public trust more than a lot of other public institutions. And we can be the space for that debate that we've always wanted to be, because the culture wars pit people against people when there's a lot more nuance that museums could be helping drive, help to drive. Um, but more prosaically, I mean, video is only getting stronger and stronger. Instagram is basically already given up on teenagers because TikTok stolen them. Uh, so it's just an endless cycle of new platforms and new formats of content. But yeah, video and presenter led is going to be the future. I might have to walk and talk, but I can still talk. Great. Well, I, I realise we are slightly over time, and obviously clearly you are slightly over time as well. But I do want to just, um, I just want to see if we can get uh, Kerry Lee's question in because I think that really follows up um, a bit on that um, and, and that's about um, from your comment about interaction Adam about not just pushing out museum content um, so she says ideally how often should a museum representative be scanning posts for opportunities to comment or to answer questions or to or to fan the flames um, hopefully positive flames <laughs> <laughs> I don't think you can really say like you should do this every week or every day because everyone's days change so much um what i tend to do is to have i find most things kick off on twitter and i have that just in the background so everyone procrastinates i think and when i'm trying to procrastinate between tasks it is just keeping an eye on what people are talking about in between moments but that's why i say you have to kind of give up your life 
and you can't ask everyone to give up their life because you kind of just need to be to be using it naturally to know what the trends are which is tricky it's like yeah. committing to reading the paper once a day yeah no absolutely um so uh, I, I wonder if we've just got time very quickly for, for one more, um, which is from Ollie. And he's asking how we square the skills needed for this, the kind of work we're proposing with the, that kind of expertise and specialist knowledge of, of museums. I mean, what, he, what he's saying is, do we wait for a born digital gen generation or, um, or for, for, for perhaps uh, other generations to kind of finally colonize those kinds of those kinds of spaces i mean i think it's, you're suggesting actually there'll be a new space by the time we've learned how to do instagram <laughs> by the time i've learned how to do tiktok that there'll be something new that i won't be able to do so. that's the issue but i think it's also i'm already seeing that new generation coming through like in my job at the royal academy we have new members of staff who just kind of understand instagram they want to get involved they already know how everything works they just need a bit of training in how to match the content to the channels but um not everyone has that luxury of being able to bring in new blood who already have the skills so i think it is really case by case and it's whether the museum thinks it's worth it based on all the other things you have to do and then whether your target audience makes sense because i think like i can't really be relevant for teenagers anymore um I think sometimes you do need people of generations to talk to generations, especially if you're going for the younger audiences, but that's maybe where you bring in volunteers and student opportunities and that kind of thing. It's a lot more co-curated. It's messy. I, no, I think so. And I think also um, having people who've got experience of um, even life experience, not just museum knowledge, but actually experience of, uh, of the workplace, et cetera, et cetera, are going to be good people to do this type of work because it's it's hard. And it's not just about knowing what the latest trends are. It's about being able to organize yourself and being able to, 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 to think about the, um, uh, about the audience, empathize with the audience, have emotional intelligence to do those things. So it's not just about mm. technical skills or, or knowledge being kind of in opposition. There are lots of other sort of soft skills around it, aren't there? some of which come with experience. Oh dear, Adam is frozen. <laughs> um, I, th I think that's probably, um, uh, oh, my, uh, my screen disappeared as well. Uh, Adam, you're back. I am back, sorry. It automatically connected to the Robert Burns Wi-Fi, even though I didn't want it to. <laughs> I, I think that's probably, as we're six minutes over, I think that's probably a, a really great uh, point to, to to wrap up so um, I'd like to thank you very much Adam on behalf of, of everybody here um, for a uh, really fascinating talk and for joining us from live from Scotland um, to, to answer our questions as well um, and, uh, and and I see that Ollie has put a bit of burns into the uh, chat as well to, to finish it off for us all um, I'm not going to attempt that at all um, so um, thank you everyone for that for your uh, questions thank you Adam again for, um, for for being able to join us and, and answer those and for a really fascinating presentation thank you I'd recommend everyone comes to Ayrshire in the Robert Burns Memorial Museum it's very good excellent back to you Isabel Thank you and thank you Adam and thank you Guy for a really um, wonderful way to finish finish the day uh, thank you to all our delegates as well for, for all your contributions and uh, we'll be back again same time tomorrow. I don't know if Ollie wants to add anything to the proceedings or we shall just um, say farewell and um, see you tomorrow. Thank you. I was just trying to unmute, sorry, uh, battling with the, the technology. So we kick off at the same time tomorrow for the third and final keynote session with uh, Nerupama Modwell, and I will be chairing that. And you'll have to put up with quite a lot of me tomorrow, I'm afraid. So apologies for that in advance. And a, and, and a big thank you to everyone for joining us today. See you tomorrow.